Welcome, yeah. everybody, to the Debate Politics AMA featuring Vosh. Vosh is an American left-wing YouTuber and Twitch streamer who debates and discusses politics online from a libertarian socialist perspective. Considered a progressive, an anti-fascist, libertarian socialist, and a big fan of democracy, we welcome Vosh. Welcome to Debate Politics. The right. questions will work as follows. You will get your preliminary question and two follow-up questions for Vosh. It is possible that we will start to run out of time and need to reduce it down to one question per person. Vosh is reserved the right to not answer a question should he feel uncomfortable. I can remove them from the stage at Vosh's request. To ask a question, simply raise your hand and we will invite you on stage to ask your question. Please remain respectful to our guest when considering what question to ask. So I'm going to go ahead and start writing down everybody's name, uh, everybody who has their hand up, and I will just be rotating through uh, the audience uh, for the first person that we are going to allow to ask the question, M.T. Foxtrot. M.T. Foxtrot, you are being invited to speak. If you are feeling too uncomfortable to literally say anything, uh, just type it in chat, um, and I would be more than happy to add you to the list. Go um, ahead, M.T. Foxtrot. Me, just one moment. Um Seems my headphones have died and I'm going insane. I'll just work with it. A pretty big into Marxism. And I've watched your stuff for a while. I've kind of stopped watching very recently. But I was going to ask, in all of your stuff, it seems like you reject Marxism. Um, can I ask why that is? In what way do you think I reject Marxism? Well, it seems that you reject the notions um, that basically led Marx to coming to a dictatorship of the proletariat, um, specifically with you know, your transition from a capitalist economy to a quote-unquote market socialist economy with an anarchist revolution following it. That's all I could really find. Um, I was going to ask why that is. Well, a dictatorship of the proletariat is just a worker-run society. It doesn't literally require a dictatorship. The word meant something different back then. I think no, that they, I, I'm aware of that. A market socialist society is a worker-run society. And un under market socialism, there's literally no bourgeois class. So mm -hmm. at that point, the only remaining thing you have to deal with is the uh, commodification of the economy. And I think that's something that's better done uh, incrementally, because doing so requires a bunch of like really tectonic economic shifts that have done poorly could lead to mass famine or starvation. And I don't think that's good. I think that the resting political power from the bourgeoisie is the necessary first step, and that all of the twiddly little uh, economic micromanagement stuff has to come after that. Right. Uh, I'm going to follow this up, not with a question, but rather a continuation of this. Um, I'm going to disagree because socialism cannot function on a market basis. Period. Please uh, refrain from trying to debate Vosh. This is intended yes, as an AMA. Um, I would recommend to ask your last question. I'll, just, yes, I'll, I'll um, simply concede and say that market socialism isn't socialism. It's just a portion of it. It's just a matter of which steps have to be taken and in what order to get socialism. But I agree, I'm not giving up on the uh, full decommodification part. All right, fair enough. I had that question stuck in my head. I did not expect to go up first. Um, Still been a pleasure. I guess, of course. Um, I guess, what, what's it like being a YouTuber of your size this involved with the rest of the online political sphere? Um, fun, mostly. I mean, I get a lot of hate for it, and that can be frustrating at times, but for the most part, I enjoyed it. I feel pretty happy about the fact that, at least according to the messages and emails I've gotten, I feel I've had a pretty decent uh, rate of success in improving people's lives, giving them arguments to help them deal with family and friends, that sort of thing. I wish I could sway more people, but I think that I would feel that way no matter how much influence I had. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to our next uh, uh, questioner is Ziva. Come on up, Ziva. You have been invited to the stage. Uh, hello, Vosh. I'm a Howdy. big fan of your work, big fan of your content. I'm a real Voshite. I was just wondering what you think of gooners, gooning, and uh, things of that nature. Yeah, I, I'm going to choose to be autistic and answer the question seriously. Um, I actually don't like the fetishization of bad mental processes that much. It's one of the reasons why sometimes I can be really suspicious of people who like consensual non-consent, because I feel like the eroticization of things that are bad for you, but you like doing anyway, can be a really good way of like self-justifying the continuation of those things, right? 
like, oh, it's not an abusive relationship, it's just a constant, like, su dub su or uh, dom sub dynamic, or like, oh, I'm not a porn addict, I actually just have a kink for this specifically, you know, like there, that kind there of stuff. There are people asking in chat, I apologize for interrupting, uh, asking, what is a gooner? They don't even know, my god. Oh, gooning is like, um, it's when you have a fetish for being a masturbation addict. So, like, the idea being, like, you, it's not just okay. that you're an addict to that, but, like, the <laughs> act of being one is, like, this itself the kink. It's, it's like, kind of, it's like, it's like an Ouroboros a little bit, you know? You're kind of, you're kind of getting off on the getting off a little bit. All right. Sorry. Go so, ahead, like, no, no love, for, no love for us Gooner Voshites? All right. L pl me. Plenty of love and, and sympathy, most of all, I think. All right. Thank you for your time. Take care. Don't rub it raw. I'll be honest, that was the first time I've ever heard that word. That I've never heard of that word before. Uh, anyway, the next person we have on the on the line is Cam Skittle. Cam Skittle, you are being invited. Now, uh, keep in mind, if you do have a question, uh, go ahead and just at me. If you uh, have a question and you do not want to be on stage uh, to ask your question directly, I can ask it on your behalf uh, if you're too nervous to do so. Uh, go ahead, Cam Skittle. Hey, my name is Victoria. Uh, I identify as Xenogender, and I know you have a neutral to positive outlook on Xenogenders, and I know that you are a gender abolitionist, but do you view Xenogenders as the possible venue through gender abolition, as in the personalization of gender to, an, uh, to a point where the societal hierarchies that were built into gender disappear, or do you think there is another way you can do gender abolition that doesn't involve uh, xenogenders? Look, first and foremost, I mean, I'll be respectful towards what people want me to call them, but no, I don't really think that's the path to liberation. The main issue that I have is that at that point, a xenogender is basically just an identity, but the term gender identity is loaded with so much innate like cultural baggage in a way that identity itself is not. I feel like we're doing the opposite of the right thing, right? Rather than trivializing gender as a construct, rather we're expanding the range of of the non-trivialization of gender. You know, ideally, I guess it would be with... I I've met some xenogender people who just like don't care, and I think that's pretty cool. But I have also met some people online who seem like their version of xenogenderism seems to be like spending six hours a day talking about their gender and everyone else's gender and this, that, the other. And like at that point, it just feels like we've we've sort of wokely circled back around to caring more than anybody else about the topic that I don't want to even be like... A, a, a cultural fixation, you know? But again, that's like a kind of a, how people handle it thing. And I guess there's a possibility that a lot of xenogender people just like don't give that much of a shit and it would be fine then, I guess. It's it's difficult to know because like realistically, 99% of xenogender people that anyone is going to meet are going to be online and a lot of them are going to be really young and a lot of them by virtue of being online and young are going to be dumbasses. So there's kind of a negative skew in terms of perception. But you know, I mean, whatever. I don't think it's too big of a deal. Um, I would like to say that I think a, would you say that maybe a large part of the reason that they talk about being xenogender so much is because it is such a new concept and because of the fact that it is often made into a joke, as in conservatives going, oh, so you literally identify as an attack helicopter without understanding, like, the nuances of the issue. Sure, but I don't think anyone ever will, is the problem. Like, people can barely understand gender as it's tied to our binary understanding of sex. Like, gender roles, even in the purview of cisgender people, still escape the understanding of most. Xenogenders will never be a generally accepted thing because the understanding of gender and social theory you need to have in order to get it literally just exceeds the brain functioning of most people. Like you, like we're you're. It's it's such an upper bar, you know. Usually you have to settle on simplified concepts if they're going to like sort of meet mass adoption. And I can't. I guess I just can't imagine a world where the xenogender stuff is understood in that way. There are cultures historically and around the world today that have more than two genders, but to my knowledge there has never been one that has understood xenogenders because I think it's like a very esoteric academic thing. Doesn't make it wrong, mind you, you know. But like, goddamn, can you imagine explaining to your average like Midwest dad what all like what all this means, you know? Like, well helicopter gender doesn't literally mean you identify as a helicopter. It means that there are attributes and social characteristics ascribed to helicopters. That you know, like, oof, you know, good Godspeed. Look, if we all get smarter, maybe we'll be ready for it. And then my last follow-up question would be, isn't this kind of the same type of arguments that people have used against non-binary people when 
they were first introduced. Oh, well, now you're kind of complicating the gender theory even more by adding a new factor that isn't man or woman. Originally, we just had gender nonconformity, but now you're kind of trying to add a spectrum outside of the binary. So I uh, don't know. I think you're just kind of complicating things and try explaining non-binary to a Midwestern dad. Isn't no, I agree. Kind of the I, same type of argument. No, I, yeah, it is. I say the same stuff about non-binary people. I think it's a bit easier to get non-binary than it is to get the broader theory behind xenogenders. But yeah, my, my basic criticism, the idea of it like expanding the range of scope and attention given to a subject that I want to abolish entirely and being too academically nuanced for most people to really be able to get, that applies to non-binary people too, just to a lesser extent, because I think the concept's a little bit more intuitive, like not identifying with either Right, because then it, it it's sort of like presuppo like some people treat non-binary as a third gender, and that's not correct. But people do, even left-leaning people. Yeah. So people struggle even with that. It's people are, um, you know, we're all, we're all a bit challenged up there. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I guess my final words will be uh, Vosh bad. Yeah. See ya. That's true. Take care. So for the next person, we're going to involve invite Netrunner. Uh, Netrunner, I'm looking for you. Sorry, give me one second, Netrunner. There's so many people in this chat. Apologies. Uh, let me just go I ahead really and just type the name. We have a couple of questions from in chat that can be asked on the stage. Do you want me to ask? Oh, I, I already have them in the list. All right, come on up, Netrunner. Go ahead. Uh, so my first question to you would be, would you rather not have the right to vote or would you rather be drafted? I think that for me personally, I would rather not have the right to vote than to be drafted. But I think societally, I would rather everyone be drafted than everyone be disenfranchised. It's one of the it's one of those like the the consequences of it's like broad social disenfranchisement exceed proportionally the consequences of an individual's disenfranchisement in a way that drafting doesn't. If anything, I think drafting gets better for the individual the more people are drafted, um, because that means it's like a, a socially collective problem rather than just you get specifically. Yeah, well, only if you're being collectively drafted, that is, anyways. Yeah, I mean, so ideally, I hope, is... hope I wouldn't be the only one. I don't think I'd make a great soldier anyway. Yeah, if you're the only one or you're one in a certain group. So my second question is, like, what's worse, mutilation or... Uh, Forced sex. Mutilation or what sex? Forced sex. You mean rape. rape? Yeah. Well, I suppose that depends on the mutilation. Of, I don't know if you can... Th th we're, these are two very wide axes on either side of things. I mean, losing a fingertip versus, like, brutal gang... I, 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 there's, there's a lot of factors involved in this math. I don't have my abacus in front of me. Just, uh, just answer it, you know, just make up the details on your own. Well, then it wouldn't really be answering your question. It would just be me waffling about all the variables involved. I don't really have a do way it. to answer the question. Can you not do it? No, no I, I don't think so. There's, it's, it's, I don't think there's enough information provided for there to be like a moral conclusion. Hmm, so, okay, so is it fine if I make the details? Uh, you can, though I don't know if it'll necessarily solidify my answer. Uh, where did he go? To make the details, I assume. <laughs> Big net runner. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to move on to the next person. Uh, there's a lot of people asking questions. So we're going to go to the next person who is Russia Defender. Yo, what's going on, guys? What's up? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Howdy. Go ahead, Russia Defender. All right. So um, I had a question, Vosh, right? Hmm. So last week I saw you did a video, which I was um, so pleasantly surprised by. You actually stood up for... Uh, white South Africans against the, you know, leftists who are kind of like Professor Flowers and all these people. So the question is, what are you doing in the next 90 to 100 days to defend the white race? What are you going to be doing in the next, you know, 100 days to defend from the leftists and the South African stuff? Go ahead. Well, when I'm going downtown, I practice defensive driving so that I, a member of the white race, aren't hurt by like um, getting T-boned at an intersection. You know, I don't want to like um, get injured. Uh, I look both ways when I cross the street. Dude, stop trolling, dude. Why are you trolling? Go you ahead. asked me what I'm doing to defend the white race. I mean, I know I'm just one part of it, but I mean... Um, oh, I've been trying to uh, uh, go on walks daily, even though it's been pretty warm lately. When are you going to take the Ukrainian refugees in? When are you taking Ukrainian refugees in? That's the question. Into my house, but we're all out of beds here. Oh, but I thought you cared about Ukraine. I thought you cared about the Ukrainians. Is... Where, you know, 
killing Russians. Uh, do you, out of curiosity, you care about Russia, right? I'm getting that from your yeah. name. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So right now, if I was you, if I was doing your bit, I would be a right. Ukraine defender and I would be hyperbolically representing how retarded you people are by acting the way you're acting right now. So you're like, if, if you want to make What's the point, point, you should settle a bit and think, okay, What's an actual argument I could make? And not like... I, you're not presenting arguments. You're presenting trolling. You're not presenting any arguments. All right. I'm going to move them over <laughs> haven't been to asked the, the real uh, question. audience. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't... If, uh, if the, I find, the, listen, if so I find if Ukrainian on Grindr, I'll suck them off, okay? That's my it, help with the, the, the war it, effort. If it makes you feel any better, it's the first time I've seen that person. So, I, No, I, 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 love, I like people like that. I... um. Oh, okay. I, I think... Uh, okay, there's going to be there's gonna be a number of those. That's just fine. FYI. No, 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 there's, I like people like that. I just, there have been I just some want them very, to, very I just offensive want them to, questions that people want to ask you, so... I just want them uh, to try their best. Like, wait, 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 can, they can hear me right now, right? Yeah, of course. Okay, so as a forewarning, if their goal is... So I'm letting them know, because I want them to try their best. You can't out-rhetoric me. So if you think you can get me on something, it has to be of substance. Like, you're not going to get me on, like what like bring the ukraine like think of something like i've said things surely you disagree with right like you have to give me a real because you're, you're not going to like one up me on 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 like doing a goof because i'm great at goofing i love goofing the best goof nice. for people i've ever seen i'm just letting them know and for the next person we're going to invite freddie go ahead freddie with your question hi um okay first i want to say um thank you i've been watching you for like many years and i'm actually like kind of nervous right now but um i work as a hairdresser and i've had this reoccurring client that the first time i had her she just outwardly told me that she's a part of QAnon, and i uh i live in florida and i'm a closeted trans person and i don't know what to do in that situation jesus christ okay well the honest truth is like in my experience, people who are a part of QAnon, or people who certainly people who admit to being a part of it, are essentially unreachable. Um, it's it, it, there's this unfortunate like because my my hope when I when I went into this right was like well everyone can be reached and that's true on like an averages scale, but on an interpersonal level that is a level of far gone that is difficult to deal with. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't even engage. I, I don't know if they'd be crazy enough to be like a threat to you if ever you did try to disagree with them or anything like that i just i can't imagine a person saying that to me like directly you know usually that stuff's online yeah i'm sorry no they um told me it because i asked them uh what they do for work which is just something you ask everyone really and she just outwardly told me and it made me extremely uncomfortable and she really likes me doing her hair so it makes me like very uncomfortable jesus and, christ yeah but um my uh other just very like side question because i've got to show my little autistic rant in here somewhere <laughs> is uh what are your opinions on five nights at freddy's the first game or the whole franchise either or um the, i think the franchise has spiraled off into like self-parody at this point but i genuinely think that like the first one was like a spark in the bag like indie horror title that actually did i think that the attention and the money that the first game made was totally deserved i think it did a really like pretty amazing job of capturing a very specific kind of horror that even today is really difficult for people to capture and certainly and i, I it, as evidenced by the fact that the subsequent games have failed to do it <laughs> um but uh yeah i guess it but on the same time it's also kind of spawned the entire like mascot horror genre which is largely dog shit so i don't know we can we we can I guess chalk that up to like an even L and, and W ratio on 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 the industry. I really do like the first one though. Thank you so much. This really means a lot to me that I was able to talk to you because I've been watching you for so long. I literally like have your videos playing but constantly even in the background. Thank you so much. Only the good ones, I hope. Take care and stay safe. All right. Thank you. I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to be able to say what they want. And with that being said, we're going to go with our beloved Kraut. Why are you fat? Honest to God, it's mostly Pop-Tarts. You know, they have a deceptive amount of calories. You'd think it's like, well, they're two wafers with some frosting, basically, but it's like 400 for a pair of them, which is pretty insane. I feel like they should be 300. I don't know what they're filling them with. This is pretty based, and you've been a better sport than I expected. Salute. Well, I mean, I, I'm just being honest with you. This is I'm speaking with nothing wow, but malice right now. Wow, only the one question. Oh, we oh okay. So surprised. Yeah, they had, he, didn't, he, he didn't expect me to be ready with the Pop-Tart answer. You had two more questions. 
He did. Kraut, did you want to be reinvited? Nobody expects the pop tart answer. They're all like, okay. He... I'm, I'm kind of really nervous. <laughs> okay, so how about this? We're gonna go ahead and reinvite local Iraqi agent. Uh, he just, they just came back. Uh, so let's go ahead and bring them back in. What's good? What's good? <laughs> go ahead. Howdy. Hi. Um. Hey, Vosh. Uh, I've I've listened to you quite a bit. You did a video which was like a um. I remember. I need to find the title. But it was like a Kami leaving um a late a letter from a former tanky. Um, I actually became. I remember. I remember that. Him. Yeah. I became. I. I've, I'm friends with them and everything. Like how. Because I asked them, and like, how how was it like going through that, uh, like as you, since you were like the content creator and everything? You mean receiving the correspondence to read? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't really like talking about people's personal anecdotal experiences on stream. Sometimes I think they can be very valuable as like um, a case study. I mean, anecdotes aren't entirely useless. They can be something you could you could look at and go like, ah, okay, well, this feels similar to me to my experience in some way. Um, I always I always feel really bad when I hear about stuff like that online, because while I have changed my perspectives a lot over time, I've never really felt like I've been duped by a group of people. And I feel like that would make me feel quite bad about myself, at least for a time. And I, I suppose I mostly just hope that they're feeling all right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, an, an, another um, question, I guess, um, would be, um, so I... How how do you feel about the general discourse of the amount of leftist infighting that's going on, um, at least online? Well, it's nightmarish, as always. Uh, and I seem to be the center of a lot of it, unfortunately. It seems to be something lefties have literally always done. I mean, a century ago, they would have killed each other over these disagreements. So it's nice to see, at least now, that they're contained mostly to, uh, you know, Twitter infighting. Uh, I'd really like it to stop, though. I mean, if nothing else, we can share... Uh, in in agreement on some key positions, right? I mean, even if we don't agree on all of the, uh, the you know, detailed bits, there are shared causes that we should take seriously. Anti-fascism, that sort of thing. But it seems we can't often even do that. So the the fight goes on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, one what my one last question: Are you happy that you did the debate with Hunter Avalon? Like, the, um, looking back on it when you did it, like, do you regret it? Do you, is there anything with that? Do you, like, wish you could have done anything different? Like, what's your thoughts on that? No, I'm certain, well, I don't remember the specifics of the debate. Be that was very long ago, so I don't remember yeah. the exact uh, tactics. I'm sure I could have done a better job now, certainly. But overall, no, I'm, I'm really happy I, I had that. Hunter Avalon and I don't agree on everything, of course. He's not a socialist. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he I, I think that his movement away from the positions he had then is still attributable to great personal character. And I think that that's respectable and something that should be uh, lauded broadly, because it is so rare to see people who profit from a given position moving away from it out of principle. Yeah, I myself like I, I went from the right to the left and like Hunter, like you, Hunter and even Kyle um, were like the main three that switched me. So, like, that's why, like, I'm kind of, like, happy about it. But those were the only three questions. Also, um, horses. That's that's all I gotta say. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you, horses. Um, okay. Yeah, peace, Bob. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next person who is going to be Bird Lawyer. Uh, at Bird. Uh, give me one second. Uh, I'm gonna Charlie. try to add Rayleigh. they got a whole bunch of people coming in. Uh, Bird Lawyer, you are being invited to speak. Uh, right. I'll go ahead and add the other two people. Go ahead with your question, Bird Lawyer. Uh, first off, I want to say uh, thank you for finally watching It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia <laughs> and uh, recognizing it as the progressive bastion that it is. Um, and the first question I have is um, Anna, Cus yeah, Anna Kasparian. Um, I don't know if you're ever going to get to the level of being friends ever again, but do you think that... Uh, you could ever be like amicable with her or yeah. what would it take to get there? No, I would, I would like to, I genuinely like, in spite of what a lot of people think, my numbers wise, I really genuinely don't benefit from drama. Um, I would like to be on good terms. I would like to be on good terms with all of the people who I dislike from the bread tubers to the tankies to whatever. I really don't, I don't want ever like any bridge permanently uh, burnt. But, you know, I, I think that her behavior right now is, is just ridiculous. So as, as long as she's behaving this way, I don't really see a path forward. If she ever stopped 
this and, <laughs> and acted differently. If if circumstances change, then yeah, I, I would be happy to. I mean, I reached out to her privately, even when the drama was sort of beginning to kick off. You know, I, ideally, I'd like to handle a lot of this stuff privately because, you know, maybe you can influence people behind the scenes and avoid what would otherwise be this big public confrontation. But, eh, you know, we'll see if it ever well, happens. That that kind of leads into my second question. Uh, knowing what you know now, if you could go back to the uh, person tweet, like the day of, uh, do you think that you would do anything different? Well, I didn't engage with that tweet on Twitter. At least I don't think I did. My memory is pretty bad. I, I remember not engaging with that tweet directly. Maybe I liked some responses to it. Other people trashing her. I, I, I tried to keep a hand off it and I, I messaged her privately. I think, I think looking back though, I don't know if she sounds kind of sanctimonious. I don't know if she could have been saved. The arc that she went on starting from that point, it was already too late. I would have to go back further. Maybe there was some kind of point before that where she lost faith in the left or in the online left enough that it made it like hardened her to any potential like she she grew too cynical to that. I don't know. Maybe that happened years ago, but I think that point was already too late to keep this from happening. I could be wrong, though. That's just my impression. All right. Uh, and then final question. Do you have like a 24 hour? I loved your 24 hour stream. So you have one planned in the future at, at some point? Yeah, well, the next one, I know that for sure we're going to do a, pro I, I assume so, at least. I haven't checked with them, but I imagine it would be good to, a Progressive Victory uh, fundraiser stream, because um, we haven't had Progressive Victory do canvassing and phone banking work during an actual presidential election, and this is going to be like an all-hands-on-deck kind of thing. So I, I, I want to like help with funding there, even though I think they've secured funding from other sources too. So like they're doing some some big boy stuff. I'm, I'm really proud of the work they've been doing. Um, and there's that. And there are a couple other I have in mind. I've been really hesitant to lately because my sleep schedule has been so bad that I legit worry that I, I'd be like 13 hours in and I would just like die in the chair and then <laughs> sort of like rot here visibly with the flies and stuff. But I do like 24 hour streams. I'd, I'd like to do some again. All right. Well, thanks, man. Uh, thank you. Have okay. a great day. Uh, but we are going to the next person who is going to be Deer. Uh, let's go ahead and invite Deer to the stage. Uh, give me one moment. Uh, so I had a quick question for you, Vosh. Mm -hmm. What do you think Democrats can do in this upcoming election to have a repeat of 2022? I know it won't ever be the same like it was, but what do you think they should focus on? That's really difficult. Um, I think, honestly, I think they have to be meaner. It, it's like there are so many uh, potential dubs that the Dems have left on the table because they're not willing to engage in or sustain the level of mockery that would be and to, to be clear here i don't mean like disingenuous mockery i think that the republicans legitimately deserve and have earned quite a lot of it and i think they need to be better about pushing that idea because at the end of the day like you can push the issues as much as you want and on issues democrats are better across the board than republicans but people resonate with narratives most of all and i just do not like the narrative that democrats have pushed for for decades now the idea of our system works fine it just needs some positive tweaks. I mean, that's been like the Clintonite line, and it's been going on uninterrupted since the 90s. The loudest proponent of it was Hillary Clinton, who had the brilliant idea to challenge Donald Trump's Make America Great Again with America is Already Great. What what was she thinking? There has to be an acknowledgement of like a danger and a narrative to overcome it. And I think that's a real narrative, right? They just have to they have to be willing to commit to that. Yeah, I, 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 I think I hold that same sentiment for the most part is start fighting fire with fire rather than being all cordial and nice all the time. And I think also another thing is, is uh, I wish uh, we would fight more with policy more than anything else of like, this is what we have. These people don't have this. I know, I, I, I agree. I think that they should also be much more direct about that. Recently, Biden has to, there was this thing where like Republicans would vote against the infrastructure bill, but then like they're taking credit for stuff that's being built with it, like a bridge is being built in a town and they're like, yeah, look at this wonderful new bridge, but they voted against that. So I guess mm -hmm. Biden has started having signs put up where it's like funded by Biden's bipartisan infrastructure bill. And I think they need to do that all the time. Because basically every yeah. good thing in this country comes from at least at the very least some kind of um, like moderate compromise bill that gets passed. But usually it's Democrat pushed, you know, Republicans obstruct in the legislature, not Democrat. Well, not, you know, more so than Democrats, at least. So, yeah, take more possession over your wins. 
and more possession over their L's. And I think that'll work. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a pretty good... Uh, I hold that same position as well, is that like I feel Republicans are more reactionary and will block whatever it is just because a Democrat is trying to push it through, and I don't really think that's the right way to govern. Um, I did have another uh, question for you, though, is uh, you mentioned Pop-Tarts. What's your favorite Pop-Tart flavor? Generally, it's just the the cinnamon... Is it just cinnamon sugar one? But I, I also really like... There was a, an Amazon Fresh opened up downtown in Seattle, I guess probably ages ago. I only just noticed it recently. But I really like the uh, Amazon brand Pop-Tarts. They're really cheap and they're really good. I, and they're also 50 calories less per double for some reason. So I... They're like one dollar per box, so I bought like like two bags of them, and I've just had that in my house for a while. Dude, that's dangerous! Like one dollar for a box of pop It's pop so tarts, good. Dude. The uh, the hot fudge ones, though. If you've ever had those, where it's like a brownie one or something like that, like a Sunday one, dude. Oh, yeah. I have oh, that yeah. one all the time. It's so good. I've had the every cream one is pretty good get, too. Yeah. Uh, and then I had one more question for you. This is the last one. Mm -hmm. Favorite video game? Like your top five. Uh, I don't know if I can do a top five, but Pathologic 2 is probably my favorite, like, artistically. World of Warcraft is the one that I've had most fun of in terms of, like, raw value and, and time investment, I guess. And in terms of just, like, sheer joy that I got while playing it, probably Banjo-Kazooie. Ooh, I've never, I've never hopped into Banjo-Kazooie. But if you get the chance, a new Diablo game is pretty good. But uh, I appreciate you talk, taking the time to talk to me. I'll consider your recommendation. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> okay. All right, bye. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add Sierra Nevada to the queue. Uh, go on. I'm sorry, not to the queue, to the stage. Come on up, Sierra. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Vosh. How's it going, man? Howdy. <clears throat> hey, my question is uh, more about uh, resource allocation within market socialism. Hmm? So uh, in a market socialist economy, um, so we agree what that means, right? Where we might have certain nationalized sectors of the economy sort of commanding the, uh, running the commanding heights, let's say, and the rest of the economy is made up of a sort of a decentralized network of worker co-ops operating in some sort of regulated market environment. Um, how can we assure that the expansion of enterprises or the creation of novel enterprises in response to, ch to changing demand side pressures in that market setting can be provided with the resources they need to they need to be either created in the first place or grow in size without sacrificing uh, the democratic worker ownership um, and sacrificing that basically to external holding of shares. Basically, how do we invest in growing co-ops where we need to grow them without like an external, sh external shareholder model? Do you imagine that this would primarily be done by like some sort of state-owned sovereign wealth fund-like institution? Or are you fine with like uh, a certain percentage of each cooperative being essentially like a publicly traded company in a similar manner to our current stock market, like workers throughout the economy sort of pooling resources together to invest and maintain a certain degree of ownership in some other co-op that they're not directly a part of. And if that's the case, how do we prevent this from consolidating back into like a, a capitalist model of private ownership? I think there are a lot of ways to improve on the system we have currently, but I think the first suggestion that you offer, the one where there's essentially a state fund, is the one that I lean more towards as a preferable option. Canada has this. Um, the uh, Well, every country has this to some, not every country, a lot of countries have this to some extent, but Canada has like an arts funding program where the government will give out grants to promising artistic projects. I think the one that I'm most familiar with that was funded as such would be Cuphead, the, the game that everyone's familiar with, where if, if something looks promising, they're willing to fund it. Now, I think that in the absence of all of the capital that gets bled into um, the stock market and our system of like uh, venture capital investment, you know, profiteering, I think that leaves a lot of potential wealth and time on the table that could be used to build up a sort of local reservoir of wealth that communities can uh, use in, uh, in, a, in a democratic fashion. Maybe like on a national state and local level, you would have different treasuries you could pull from. And from the city, you would have, I don't know, maybe after a year, you'd have like a million or two dollars of sort of discretionary investment that people could vote on or make cases to. I, I Unfortunately, I think that like a big problem with proposing socialist solutions is that they sound quite droll and boring in ways that the capitalist investment model is not because the capitalist investment model is all about proposing the image of this like risk-taking daredevil venture capitalist who single-handedly builds up this empire with the cash in their pocket you know in reality this almost never happens 
And I think a lot of social good could come from if you want to put a restaurant or a barcade or something else in your community, go out there, go to like a town meeting and make a case like, hey, here are my design plans. I have the research and experience necessary to do this. But they give me money, give me money, give me money, pay up. And that doesn't sound as exciting. But like as a person who lives in that town, who would you rather have, you know, building stuff nearby? somebody who had to go through a vetting process through local democratic means or some like venture capitalist who's going to set up a Walmart, drain wealth from your small town and then leave. You know, it's it's I think it's the best way to go, but it'll be complicated, more complicated, certainly than I'm capable of understanding if it ever happens. Yeah, we can definitely agree it'll be complicated. Um, uh, a follow up question for that would sort of be um, when I'm thinking of a model of market socialism, one of the things I, I try to think of is like, what is the line in my mind? for sort of sectors of the economy that I think would perform better under a sort of nationalized state-run monopoly, sort of like an NIH UK style thing when it comes to healthcare, but to other sectors of the economy. And um, what things should be left up to sort of decentralize whatever the market is doing, but we just want to have it worker controlled and introduce some economic democratization. How do you go about thinking of that delineation between, okay, this is the thing that we should operate sort of as a as a nationalized um, institution, and what sort of things, at least for now, keeping the the ultimate goal of total decommodification in mind, what are the things for now that are like, that is the thing that I'm going to prescribe to the market? Depends on the elasticity of the demand. If it's something humans need and will pay out the nose for, whether or not it's reasonably priced, healthcare, housing, food, those are easy marks for uh, decommodification. If it's stuff that genuinely is a luxury, for example, food is a necessity, restaurants are not. You know, I don't think we need to have some kind of gigantic state apparatus for mandatory restaurant creation in every town. Uh, that seems a bit silly to me. You know, if people don't have the resources to go out to the restaurant, that's unfortunate, but it's certainly not as pressing as making sure they have housing, food, health care. So it, it's what, whatever can be afforded, whatever can be done in a sort of uh, outstanding concentric rings, starting probably, I, I imagine, with, with uh, housing and food and going out from there. Healthcare would be the next one. And then whatever they feel can be done. Okay. Uh, I guess my, only, my last question would be, do you think that a, um, your at least proposed transitionary state of market socialism do you think that there are what challenges do you see with that as far as compatibility with our current political structure, that being um, uh, representative democracy operating under the um, presumption of federalism, basically? They're compatible. There's agitation, but there's also agitation between democracy and capitalism. The reason I propose it as a transitory state is because of the compatibility. It means it's possible to address the economic shift and the political shift at their own pace in reasonable time without needing to do this gigantic single overhaul that that fixes both problems at once. I don't think I've ever seen an example of that working in an in like industrialized society. I think that would be chaos. So the, the, the goal would be, you know, you make the changes you can within the systems that you can. And then if you need to change those systems, you make sure that they can be done either in isolation or at the very least without up, upturning everything. Great. I really appreciate the answers and I appreciate your work. Thanks for letting me ask your, my questions to you. Thank you. Thank you. And take care. Uh, Teodoro, go ahead with your question. Hi, Vosh. Um, I have a quick question for you. You've okay. made a lot of statements that are controversial. Like, for example, you said that owning child porn is morally neutral. Do you plan on defending or walking back those statements? Well, I think it would be a pretty difficult statement to walk back because I didn't make that statement. I made the statement that in a system where the abuse and exploitation of children for economic gain is considered to be morally acceptable, in such a system, a person would have to argue then the heinous belief that the same could be said about child exploitation material. Now, as a socialist, of course, I don't believe that. I don't believe in child slavery either, which was the thing I was comparing to child pornography production. I think that most people would agree with my statement on that because it really refers, I think, to the fulfillment of basic liberal moral ideology, the idea that children shouldn't be hurt for, um, for the production of, of any sort of product. So um, hopefully you and I agree on that. Okay, I think we do. And then my last question is, what is the youngest horse that you would have sex with? Well, um, <laughs> tragically, uh, I'm, I'm just not attracted to horses. I want to be a horse. If I was a horse, Nay. I feel like I would I would be out there being pretty randy from an early age, though. I feel like I'd be a young horse thinking, I'm ready. I'm ready to get out there. 
Okay. I don't, I don't know how old horses are. Thank you for answering my question. You were a better sport than I expected. I don't even know how old horses are when they die. I don't, I don't actually know uh, anything about horses. We've got Zeus. Go ahead and ask your two questions. Sweet, 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 sweet. Uh, what's up? Howdy. So, two questions. First question is simple. Um, which one do you value more, social issues or economic issues? No, you value both, but if you had to pick, which one do you weigh more? I genuinely don't think they can be extricated from each other, right? Because um, economic issue in, in a liberal, econ like capitalist society, economic uh, harm it, or economic disparities are the weapons used to marginalize like racial communities in large part, right? Like a huge part of the post um, Jim Crow racism that black people have experienced are sort of the economic downstream i i really don't think they could be separated i think like it, 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 i can imagine tyrannically evil worlds where there is only racism or where there is only classism but they would both be fantasy worlds because i don't think they can really exist without each other sure uh second question which is um when it comes to ip laws right um or uh people like owning like their likeness or product um how would that work in your under your social system God on it, true. I don't really, I don't know how IP law should really be set right now, because I don't think they should be totally abolished. I think that some level of IP protection is necessary under our current system. Under a socialist system, even a fully decommodified one, I don't know. I mean, even if people don't have money to spend, I feel like there's still some value in, in protection of a person's intellectual property at some level, but not really at the level that exists now. I mean, current IP laws are just like a Disney creation, basically. I'm not really sure. It's really complicated. I, I definitely want IP law to be scaled down massively from where it is right now. I don't really know where I want it to stop. No, uh, that's all good. You're being pretty honest. Um, Thank you. That's it. Oh, thank Enjoy you. Take care. Go ahead and A, Frog. Hello, Vosh. I'm Howdy. Zaxby's. Nice to meet you. Uh, I learned of you when I was younger and on like the complete other side of the political aisle. Uh, so I'd like to address some things that I would have asked you then and now. Uh, why are your opinions on Jewish topics, if they feel very detached from the reality of Jewish culture and uh, general Jewish sentiment from what I've observed of your uh, videos? What, uh, what positions do I have that break with um, uh, Jewish people's understanding of their own culture? Okay, so uh, the select example I think of generally when I like relate to this idea is uh this video you did on rudy rockman a while ago who to be fair is a zionist and i don't agree with zionism as a ideology but he uh he bases argumentation on things which jews generally do agree to open it up to zionism which uh you know ex exploitive of jewish identity but whatever but the points he made you called fascistic or naziistic you said the idea that all jews have a shared uh culture and sentiment is anti-semitic even though that's something that jews believe we believe that we're people who have a shared culture and belief that's not something that's intrinsic to zionism that's something that's jewish oh then i would consider that to be a fascistic belief of jews it is factually incorrect there are jews all over the world there are jews who can't talk to each other born in different countries with completely different understandings not only of themselves and of their culture and their language but of the torah the idea that there's one culture is ridiculous. There is no monoculture of any racial group. Uh, not even the Amish. There are splits even in their relatively tiny community. There is, of course, a shared cause with Jewish people, given the fact that they face so much global maligning, right? I mean, there's there's definitely no, um, you know, it's not a complete break. But uh, I, I don't like the idea of promoting a monoculture, because the inherent linking of culture to blood is something that's been used to justify I'd say a lot of bad ideas, most of which have been unfavorable to Jewish people, historically speaking. So I, I think it's good to, to, to trend away from that. Um, yeah, I have my own grievances with that, but I can understand the perspective. Yeah, I don't have an issue with that. Uh, let me... Let's see. Uh, I need you to answer this as seriously as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think frogs are provable ontological good? No. The little green things. No, they're no. not. I okay. intersubjectively believe they are. Oh, damn. I know. I'm sorry. The 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 this is, the burden so of over. being a moral anti-realist. It's so over. Okay. Shout out to the Gunner Army and Rose. Thank you, Vash. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Ziva, for being a good Very Gunner. Well. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next person, who's Ketamina, who's already in the list. Go ahead and speak, Ketamina. You, the floor is yours. Hello. Um, so, Vosh, uh, I'm in your server, and it is a lovely place. 
Uh, but I just have to ask. There's a server, or there's a channel in your server called um, Drama Posting, if you're aware of it. And um, you have some contentious takes about AI art. So I just have to ask, um, when are you going to debate Drama Posting about AI art? Uh, never. I never want to dignify the subject with a proper debate on my channel, though I've gotten many requests to do so. And I've found that every time people take issue with what I have to say with AI art, it is because they have like a borderline sociopathic inability to understand the purpose of human communication. Like I get the, I get these emails sometimes where people are arguing like there actually is no difference between watching, I, I don't know, watching like uh, 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 Star Wars and watching like if an AI just like randomly made it. With It's like it's the same, like, like communication isn't a part of it. It's just images or pixels to view. I, I can't stand that. But, you know, I guess... Moral anti-realist and all, I can't really objectively prove either point, so I guess I'll just sort of grug rock them uh, and not debate the issue. Apply the old rock, yeah, I like that. Um, okay, so for my second question, um, I kind of didn't think about it because that was all I really wanted to ask. So I guess I'll just say, um, one second, can I just get like a second to think? Oh, go right ahead. Oh, yes, sorry, that was it. Um, so you said you liked Spider-Verse, yes? Yeah. Yeah, so you are aware that was made with AI, correct? Um, it's not made with the AI that uh, I talk about when I talk about AI art. Um, I'm okay with algorithms. I mean, I've drawn digitally before, and algorithms are used to do stuff like uh, anti-aliasing, uh, line smoothing, that sort of stuff. The algorithm that they were using, or AI, or whatever you want to call it, um, was, was sort of uh, positioning the 2D lines drawn over the 3D models as they moved. I'm okay with stuff like that. It's a tool to be used purposefully by artists. The issue I have is that when I talk about AI art, I'm talking about these generative algorithms that operate on so many levels of abstraction that there's no way to directly control what they produce. You're basically like, it's like dropping a, a, a ball down the world's largest pachinko machine with like a billion possible outcomes. You know, it's even if you can sort of control the means, it's not really a tool. You're sort of like tossing a coin into a wishing well and i and i think that level of abstraction destroys the human element okay okay that's interesting uh ras and terrain you're up next go ahead ras uh hello there can you hear me howdy howdy uh a bit nervous here so i'm gonna stumble my words a bit but uh here we go luckily i have something written here so i can read up on so uh, I've got a hint in your content regarding the necessity of voting blue no matter who on the general election which i agree upon you know it's uh, it's uh, reasonable if ranked choice voting, voting is going to be the solution here towards this conundrum, under democracy at least, uh, shouldn't you be a bit more louder, dedicating perhaps a few more videos towards advocating for the solution? Well, there has to be a good access for it. The problem, honestly, is that um, for, like getting rid of first-past-the-post voting is a step, but it's not going to fix the problem in and of itself, because at the end of the day, the American electorate are still confined to a pretty narrow Overton window in terms of viable and acceptable political ideology. I think that it's something I would promote a bit more actively, but at the moment, it like with every passing election, it feels like the the time to call for it grows more and more distant. You know, because we keep the the whole fascism problem keeps escalating and escalating. escalating. If if we ever had a period of relative detente or, or calm or something where it felt like the nation's major issues were debating. I don't know, like, remember the NAFTA debates? Like, that was a big thing. Like, that's so little compared to what we talk about today in terms of, like, mm -hmm. the stakes involved. I, I hope that one day there will be a time where the American public will consider seriously the value of ranked choice voting. But right now, it just feels like I, I would just be saying it to say it, you know? It'd be like a virtue signal. Like, here, everyone, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people who, uh, who's aware of it and promotes it. I don't know if it would do anything. Maybe I should more, but I, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess well, yeah, I guess we'll see how things play out in that regard. I really hope. Uh, my second, yeah, me too. Uh, second question in this uh, uh, regarding reaching out to people where they are. For example, I've seen you talk about the necessity of you know perhaps you know if you have a very conservative place uh, or area, you go ahead and reach out you know with the face that they go ahead and recognize. In this case, for example, a white male, for example. Uh, in that regard, uh, you know. I am a bit of a lonely person myself, so, you know, I do fre uh, frequent a lot of these circles, and one, I see that you are kind of ambivalent because, you know, you tend to do your things uh, how you like to do is uh, the VTubing community. So, if you don't know this, anyone, that's fine. 
uh, I know Zurus, which is a good, uh, you know, promoter for politics in that regard. But is there anyone who is, I guess, in this case, feminine uh, that uh, would be in those uh, and uh, that would be promoting leftist values in that in that community? I'm afraid. I find I, it well, I I know um, uh, aristocracy. Um, I know that Star Panda does VTubing, though in the in the grand scale of things, they're they're quite small. I think relative to the big VTubers, I I don't know how much space there is for VTubing to break out. In, in, in a political format, largely because um, with the greatest of respect, I think that a lot of the VTubing community is kind of designed for and oriented around capitulating to male loneliness, gooning, and pedophilia. So that's not all of it, of course. There's plenty yeah, of good get, VTubers. Get but as a community, uh, I see, yeah, I'm, I don't know. I mean, Live streaming, I guess, is primarily defined by XQC type, so maybe it's pretty bad all around. It would be nice to see some like really large, politically oriented VTubers, though. I, I think that'd be pretty cool. And I don't think VTubing is invalid as a, a medium. Right, those are my two questions. Uh, thank you very much there, Bosch. Manuel is deciding to post a question. Vosh, you see the majority or key elements of the Republican Party as racist fascists. Does it worry you that Republicans are making more inroads with more minority voters as seen in the last two elections? Why do you think minority voters are falling to fascism, despite you saying Republican politicians uphold a racist system and are generally racist to minorities, thus hurting the same minorities and that are voting Republican? Well, the, the easy answer would be because all people, regardless of race, are idiots. But the more complicated answer is that most Republicans aren't knowingly fascist. They're promoting ideals that are fascist, but they're not cognitively, they're not ideologically fascist. Likewise, it's the case with racism. There are plenty of racists in the Republican Party, and I mean like overt racists or people who believe in racism, but I'd be willing to bet the majority of Republican Party voters are people who actually do believe the narrative pushed by the party. It's not as though Donald Trump goes up there and says, I'm a racist, I'm perfect, you know, whatever. There are still elements of subtlety and dog whistling, as transparent as they may be. The, keep in mind, the majority of minorities, by far, vote Democrat. I mean, white people are the most likely to vote Republican. If we just had minorities voting in these elections, it would be a Democrat sweep across the country easily. There's been a gain with Latin voters down in the South. I think a lot of that is because, um, A, they don't like Biden, which is complicated, but not entirely invalid. And B, I think that a lot of uh, Latin immigrants, people who came here legally, from Mexico or Honduras or whatever, don't like being lumped in with what they consider to be the people who are taking the easy way in, the illegal immigrants. I think they're kind of doing like a pick me thing a little bit where they're thinking like, ah, well, I don't wanna be lumped in with that group of people. I'm going to show how much I reject this behavior by not voting for those Democrats, you know? I think that's a dumb idea, but I think it's not, I don't think it's like minorities are like throwing their arms up and going, well, I'm a fascist racist now, you know? It's, as always, there's a lot of complexity behind why demographics of people vote for anything um, that are always a bit more nuanced than just like the rote ideology of the party. Next, we're going to go ahead and have our lovely Scribbles, otherwise known as Gold Digger in their name. Uh, go ahead, Gold Digger, AKA Scribbles. Hi, Vosh. Howdy. Nice to you. Neither. Um, okay, thanks for coming to the server. Um, big grab, big grab. Um, so I have a question for you. Um, what is your view on like Dusty? Um, wait, can I curse or no? Yeah, as long as they slurs. Oh, beautiful. What's your view on like dusty ass men who are like crying about like, oh, these women are gold diggers. These women are like shysty. These women ain't shit. All that bullshit, right? Because they like want a certain class of men, right? Because like, I don't know, like you see all these like, I don't know, like red pillars, or whatever, who are like saying all this BS. And it's like, dude, you, you mid, like you're absolutely mid and you'll go for girls who are like, you know, also more attractive than you, women who are like educated and all that stuff. Right. And I'm just like, I don't know. I just want like your view on it. And like, what's your view on like these, like, I, I, they're not like, obviously not insults, right. They like, fuck, uh, they like smash whatever. Sorry. I almost said a no, no word. They smash whatever, but it's like, but you're like, um, spiritually incel. And that's like my view on it. I think that there are women who have unreasonable expectations when it comes to guys' income. Though I think that this proportion of women are heavily overstated online, because there are these podcasts yeah. full of like 40 IQ men who will go onto the street and pay women $100 
to be dumbasses on their pod and say, yeah, I wouldn't date a guy unless he made at least 500k. Uh, isn't that like the average income? Like, I think that shit is heavily blown up, and it's largely blown up in incel communities where they want to reaffirm the belief that all women are gold digging whores. Okay. I also but don't, like, I also okay, don't blame women, by the way, for wanting a guy who has a higher income, because let's face it, right? Like, A, the economy's tough, and B, yeah. I don't like the fact that, like, it, it, the, the same people who think that men should be out there, like, on their grind set, and women should be getting, like, pregnant and barefoot in the home, are then yeah. the ones who complain that women are like pre-selecting on income it's it's just the the, the hypocrisy of the the system yeah. or whatever it, it's it's in silly i agree no yeah but like i think i have like a pretty like basic view on it right like you want a man who makes like a so the next question we're no. gonna <laughs> I respect good luck <laughs> i just want to get to as many people as possible uh nothing against you scribbles i love you we all, all love right. you scribbles. anyway from Biodrug, if you were to create a very short video in which you had to distill your message while incorporating key concepts of philosophies of left-wing ideology, what message would you choose to persuade younger men and why? I, it, w it would have to be about the myth of meritocracy. It would, I, I can't do it right now, of course, but I would try to hit, I, if I had like 60 seconds or something, I would try to hit the idea of like, things are worse than they used to be. We don't have what we deserve and we are trying hard. Why don't we have these things? Well, this, this, and that. And you would talk about how, like, okay, well, the rug's been pulled out from under us, you know? Because uh, young men feel a lot of despair at the world today, and I don't blame them for that, right? Like, not just, like, even the incel -y types or whatever. I mean, a lot of incels act ridiculous, but, like, dating apps fucking suck. And we all know for a fact that, like, the economy's getting worse and worse for every successive younger generation. Like, nobody's owning a home anymore. Even I don't want to own a home. Like, even that, like, it's, it's ridiculous disparity an opportunity and you have to hit on that and you have to make people understand that the solution to this is not returning to tradition or whatever tradition is what caused this all of the problems we're facing right now are a direct byproduct of the economic models that we set out in like the reagan era and prior to that in like the 1940s when we spread out and suburbanized all over the country and therefore like set out from the you know the, the, the how humans were meant to live in communities we don't need to return to tradition we need to listen to the critiques of these systems that have existed for hundreds of years but i wouldn't say all that i'd say it real short and smooth like you want to appeal to people's insecurities but in a constructive way because i mean a lot of those security insecurities are valid you want to propose good solutions Something that feels right. Okay, and for our next uh, questioner will be QueeQ. What's good, Schleim? I'm Henny. I'm a recovering meth addict. Um, I have a question regarding substances, if you're comfortable with that. Go right ahead, and congratulations on your recovery. Um, have you ever drank a frosty boysenberry-infused acorn bisque out of a duly stacked styrofoam chalice? And if not, would you ever consider doing so? Uh, no and no. I don't know what that is, but I think it would kill me. I, uh, I get, um, at heartburn if I drink even a sip of soda. It's also called Gecko Cum, but that's usually, like, the street name. It would, it would probably instantly kill me. All right, thank you. Um, God bless Ziva and the Ziva party line. Shout out okay. to Okay, we're gonna move on. Good Next luck, person. Uh, this is a, uh, written question from Blue Q saying, what does Vosh think is more important, moral questions and answers or practical ones? I don't think they're extricable. If a solution proposed is impractical and can, impractical and can't work, then focusing on it detracts from a potential solution. It hurts. When, that's why I get frustrated when people are impractical. Um, I mean, you, it's, it's like an ideological purity thing, right? Like, the, the correct answer to every question as a leftist is, well, it would be fixed under communism. And is this true? Yes, of course. Communism will fix everything, obviously. It's that simple. But we're not there. So some effort has to be put into the means by which we arrive at that point. And if the solutions proposed don't help in that process, then you're not fixing anything, right? It's, it's the easy thing. It's the easy solution. So I, I don't think there's a, a difference, really. I mean, if, if I spend my time arguing with impractical solutions quite a lot, I think. I think that's the big problem with the left, even. Uh, liberals may be dull-minded and uh, inexpressive and uh, simple, but they are practical, at least within their own means. I think that we could take a little bit of that pragmatism for ourselves, be a bit more effective towards our own ends. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to August. So my question for Vosh is, you know waifus, right? I've heard of the uh, concept. Okay. So do you 
like so do you think that if somebody actually married a waifu like would it be valid do you think you mean so we you you mean like an anime girl but in concept yeah or a husbando if uh, that works too i mean i don't put much stock in marriage as an institution but i have to say i would be pretty concerned for the well-being and social acclimation of a person who made that decision i uh you know there are there are lots of real cute 3d girls out there i gotta say you know, with the colored hair and the wacky outfits and everything. I, I believe in a better future where, where, where we all have an IRL waifu that we can marry. Yeah, I have one. Based. But she's from an anime. Oh, well, I'm glad but you're she's happy. She's real. Oh, that's good too. All right. And then as for the next question we're going to have is... Uh, feet master, go ahead, feet master. Uh, the floor is yours to ask a question. What do you think, like the um, the interpretation of like a uh, history has has had on like the um, the general politics, at least in America? Interpretation of history, what? I'm afraid you're speaking quietly. I'm sorry about that. Um, like the interpretation of history, what what effect has it had on like politics in America? Like, yeah, just just in general. Well, it's pretty broad. I mean, it's essential. You know, people are inspired to um, make changes in large part based on the narratives that we've told about our past. That's why for basically all of American history, every major step forward or backward we've taken as a country has to be rooted in some kind of imagined American legacy. Even back when the country was formed, we were talking about, you know, the, the uh, as our existence, a colony and England and so on and so forth. That's why it's so important that we have a good understanding of and control over what elements of history are taught. I don't think that we should be disingenuous about it. I think we should be forthcoming because, of course, a proper telling of history is a history of class struggle. It's almost impossible to understand the world without viewing it through that lens, even as a non-Marxist. So, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's absolutely pivotal. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next person who is going to be uh, Jims. Go ahead, Jims. The floor is yours. Hello, Vosh. How are, how are you doing today? Good as always. Howdy. That's good to hear. So I have just one question, of course, but I only had one from the start. And that question is, would you please uh, box Sam Hyde in the future? Uh, no, I would lose. Wait, wait are, you, absolutely, are you kidding me? Hold on. You saved that crap for Hassan, okay? Hassan's got two inches on me and he's way more built. What is it? What, what contest would there be for me, okay? I'll, 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 I'll box uh, weak, frail women. Uh, wheelchairs? Crutches? That's that's the ballpark I'm talking about, okay? All right. Uh, so Sam, you, do you hi, think good lord. Be, he's like a gorilla. He's huge. Yeah. Do you think you could beat my autistic little sister in a fight? Absolutely. I think I could. You could tell right. her that, too. I, all right. I'll be sure to. Have a wonderful day. You too. You too. Take care. Okay. It looks like we just got Eliza Lee back. Can I Eliza, heard? are you there? Yep. We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. Okay. It's Eliza Lee from chat. I know you told us not to join and ask you questions, but mine's a good one, okay? Hit me up. <clears throat> okay. Media literacy is dead. People, cops are watching The Punisher and thinking that it's about them. People are liking Homelander. Nobody knows anything about what's being written. Remember how you mentioned this once? Marx didn't like um stories that were very simplistic about oh the the the, the union fights the capitalists and wins and because he thought it was too simplistic my thought was is it almost a necessary simplicity sometimes because people are so media illiterate that they'll read into it improperly if you are too subtle i i would agree with what you are saying that unsubtlety is not necessarily the same as bad writing I think a good example that everyone can point to where things are simultaneously completely unsubtle but also good would be Tarantino films. It is, you, you, you would have to be brain damaged to walk away from Django without an understanding that slavery is bad, certainly as presented in the movie, the movie's message is pretty clear on that. But people like Django, you know, because it is, it is unsubtle and aware of it. It doesn't, it, it's not pretentious. Most of Tarantino's films are, are like that. There are lots of films like that. The Iron Giant is subject to some misinterpretation, but I, I think it's generally considered to be, you know, pretty unsubtle. There are a lot of liberal narratives about like overcoming monarchy or despotism that are quite unsubtle. I think, for example, it's pretty difficult to read like a right wing narrative into The Last Airbender. Steven Universe is dripping with gay, so of course that one's pretty unsubtle as well, and it's it's social um 
you know, uh, lean. But yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think it is okay to lean into it. And the difference between deliberately unsubtle and preachy is how rock hard you are when you're writing the scene, in my opinion. So we just, we just have to try harder. Oh, but that's bad, because I'm always like that whenever I write any scene. Then you're getting it, and you'll get it. Damien, I'm going to invite you right now. All right, come on up, Damien. H Hello, Wash. Um, I'm a viewer. Uh, viewers have been watching since, like, around the Ukrainian war invasion, you know? Howdy. Um, my question was, what are your thoughts on, like, meta politics? Do you think they're useful, and do we need more awareness about them? By me okay, so I've heard meta politics used in a few way. I would like, a, um, I would like a follow up reference. Uh, so, like, yeah. um, almost looking at like a politics ad from the background and analyzing every individual ideology, even our own. This seems like one of those things that has a lot of value in a in an academic space, and probably less so in an advocacy space. I think that right now, the real political struggle is one for simplification. The right has landed on very simple, incorrect narratives that they push time and time right. again, relentlessly. And I think that we struggle with this because the truth doesn't necessarily have to be simple, whereas a lie always can be. I think that our primary focus right now should be on taking what we have and trying to find ways to distill it, to make it palatable. And that's a public work. Of course, in the academic space, and certainly it can be valuable to look at things that way. Okay, I think that's a, a good analysis. Next, we're going to go ahead and move Take on care. to Rally. And by the way, for uh, I was just told that uh, Red Lemon has fixed the problem and will be returning. Um, go ahead, Rally, you're, and uh, Red Lemon, you're next. Oh, okay. So I, I, here's my question for you. You know, I'm a fan, of course. Well, you all know that. So I've run into a problem because I'm, I li I'm like you. I like arguing with people. Like when I argue with uh, certain people, they're like, like their main thing is like re religious, like their spiritual beliefs behind them. So like they arrive at a conclusion because they believe a higher power or because of spiritual mysticism, like it says it should be that way. Like, what would you like encountering people like that? And like, especially like in electoral politics, how would you like deal with that? I'm generalizing a little bit here, but in my experience, oftentimes when people who believe in a deity arrive at a religiously oriented conclusion, they're using religion as a way of justifying something they already wanted to arrive at. You know, people very rarely pick up the Bible, look at it, close it, and then change everything about their life immediately because they realize they were wrong and their teachings weren't in line. You know, no wealthy man picked up, saw that it would be more difficult for them to enter heaven than an camel through the eye of a needle, and then just gave all their money away. People usually interpret stuff like that in ways that support and metaphysically justify stuff they already believed. And at that point, then, I think the goal should be to make them not believe those things. Usually there's an underlying emotional reason, not necessarily a logical one, because if there was a logical reason, they wouldn't have to rely on a religious justification. If they're leaning in towards a conclusion, you know, maybe with regards to accepting gay identity or whether or not it's right or wrong to do this or that, I think it's it's good to kind of probe them a bit, talk with them. There might be a reason they believe those things outside of the religious justification. Talk with them about that and, you know, maybe they'll soften up. Though it'll take time because the whole point of this is the metaphysical justification, right? Like, they're not going to just go, oh, wait, you're right, my, my scripture reading was incorrect. They, it, It's a difficult process. Okay, you should do D&D &D streams again. That's not <laughs> a question, it's a statement. Invite to speak, Dragonfly. Go ahead, Dragonfly. Okay. Sorry. So, as someone who was, unfortunately, uh, involved in third-party stuff uh, like a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. how would you suggest removing people from its vile influence? I, I, people who are in third parties are definitely like by default populist because otherwise they would be in with the. Um, the, the mainline party that better represents them. I think it's important to direct people's populism in a positive direction because the main thing that directs a lot of people here, they don't want to be cucked, is the thing. Um, populists really don't like, you know, squaring their shoulders and saying, all right, time to vote for the Dems again. It's frustrating. It feels like you're contributing to a, you know, an interminably, you know, locked in process, like you're making it worse even. 
I think you have to find constructive outlets for that populism. I've noticed a lot of third party voters are people who actually do very little um, extra electoral advocacy. Okay. Like they don't tend to go to protests. They don't tend to go to like picket lines. They don't tend to do like strike fund stuff or any of that. Because if they had those outlets, I think it would be easier for them to conceptualize the vote as just one tiny part of a very broad political project. Without that, you know, maybe they think they don't have any choices other than to vote third party. Fair enough. Okay. And so uh, Red Lemon actually has typed his question out um, after... Uh... Dragonfly, we're going to move on to Bamboozled, but first I will ask this question. Um, perspective on masculinity. Uh, recently, discourse around the topic has increasingly been taken over by the, quote, red pill, unquote, movement. Is, it, is more traditional masculinity something that has to be completely abandoned, or can the positive aspects be salvaged without the negative characteristics? I think we need to think of it beyond the dynamic of traditional versus new masculinity, because both of those terms can refer to each other, right? Like, if you want to, you can say that a person who works every day at a tech company is soy because they're cucking themselves out of a family life. They're not spending time with their family. You know, they're a new male. They're a beta. Actually, working like 100 hours a week isn't traditional masculine virtue. But you could hit it either way if you wanted to, right? The problem is, when we say traditional versus new male, what we really mean is like, how are we narrativizing the differences between how men can behave? I, I think that we should do things that are good and not do things that are bad. Men should do things that make them happy. But we ha we can't lie to ourselves by telling ourselves n narratives about how like people were so happy back then. No, they weren't. No, they no they weren't. Remove from your mind any delusion that a hundred or a hundred fifty or five hundred years ago the average person was happier than they are now. I swear to you, they were not. And a lot of that was due to really unreasonable social dynamics. What do men want today? Well, I think men want a lot of the same stuff as women in terms of like happiness and acclimation being social engaging with people around them feeling purposeful feeling like they make a difference having friends right uh in terms of specific masculine virtues you know if you want a guy uh to act more masculine or if you as a guy want to be i think that's totally fine as long as you're not hurting yourself or others there's tons of valuable attributes in that direction strength and discipline fortitude self-reliance these things can all be great if done well but I wouldn't think of that as being traditional. I would just think of that as being good. Because as soon as you start thinking of it in that, you know, axis, I, I think it's a bit more um, constructive. And uh, next we have uh, Bamboozled. Bamboozled, go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, hello? Howdy. Uh, is my mic okay? Yes. Um, I, 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 all right. All right. Uh, I'm from Turkey. I'm uh, not a native English speaker, so I might um, speak slower. Uh, a bit anyways and yes turkey the country you hate it <laughs> anyways so uh turkey has a really nationalistic uh education system uh, it drills down in your head the uh, nationalistic tendencies uh, they you were born uh, kind of and i'm really interested in the turkey's history and fascist um fascist government uh, the 100 years ago but uh, now today's uh, turkey's uh, shape um, has shifted viewpoint has shifted towards more islamic tendencies and i'm not really sure how that will uh, affect kurdish population because kurdish population is my, my, my in majority uh, muslim and they are still just calling them terrorists. And I just wanted to hear op your opinions. I think that Turkey is in a difficult position right now uh, because they are trying to both sides the, the multipolar world. Um, Turkey is aware of the fact that if it cozied up entirely to the West, it would not only lose out on relevance and potential allyship, uh, but would also not be treated as well as the Western European countries are because the West is heavily white supremacist and would gear its interest and support largely towards majority white countries, which Turkey is definitely not. Likewise, Turkey can't shift entirely over to appeasing Russian, Chinese, or um, pan-Arab interests because A, there are severe disagreements within those groups, uh, and B, they're a lot poorer than we are. 
So I think that the hyper-nationalist angle is basically a way of cementing people's faith in the project. You know, you don't want people to sort of shiftlessly dance over towards um, Western identity or towards like a broader Islamic identity. You want people to be Turkish. Um, this is not sustainable, unfortunately. Hyper-nationalism can compensate for like international fractures for a time. But I don't think it's working. I mean, Turkey is suffering from a lot of internal strife. Obviously, its buildings aren't up to code. Um, and there's a lot of internal corruption, which got a ton of attention after that, um, the recent tragic earthquake. And, and, and additionally, you know, the insistence on alienating and continuing to scapegoat the Kurds um, reveals a sort of national weakness, a need for a narrative, a need for fear. Uh, not to even speak of the inflation rate. I think you're right to be worried about the future of your country, but I do think that there's a better road. Erdogan will eventually leave or die of old age or whatever, and when that happens, I hope that Turkey can assert its unique geopolitical situation in a way that doesn't rely on ultranationalism. Because if it does so, I think a lot of these problems will, will ease up, you know? Uh, thank you for your answer. I think so too. Uh, I just hate hyper-nationalism. Good luck, and take care. Next, uh, we have uh, V. You. V, you are already on the stage. Go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Vosh. What's going on, man? Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Howdy. Um, so I was just kind of funny the other week. I got in a lot of trouble in your uh, server for discussing the issue of conscription, and I was just uh, curious to ask the man himself, what do you think? Is it ever acceptable, justifiable, nuanced views? Yeah, it can be sometimes. Like 99% of the time when conscription is used, it's not. I think that conscription is justifiable in instances where your country is facing a threat severe enough that a military failure would incur harm equal to or greater than the conscription itself. You know, like for instance, uh, not that I, I, so I do not support Israel, but to use them as an example, right? Like if they were about to be swallowed by Saudi Arabia or something, you know, conscription in that case would be like, well, if we lose this conflict, like we lose everything. So I guess, well, they have conscription there. They have their mandatory uh, service. So that does make sense to an extent. Uh, likewise with South Korea. In Ukraine right now, I think that their conscription is justifiable. It's not great. I don't like it, but I don't like a lot of stuff involved in war. On the other side of things, obviously, Russia's conscription is completely unjustifiable because they're not doing it to defend themselves. They're doing it to conquer other territory. But I think that a conscription, even in self-defense, can be bad. Uh, it's, 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 it's tough to get that one right. Yeah, that's fair enough. I largely agree. Thanks for taking my question. Of course. Take well. And next we have Kraut again. Uh, go ahead, Kraut. Ask your question. Uh, hello, Walsh. Uh, long time no see. How are How you doing? doing? Yeah, it has been a while. I'm doing well. How about you? Still fat, though. Uh, I could complain, but who'd listen? Uh, anyways, my question to you is as follows. Um, how do you justify that it's possible on your server to post uh, nudes without you having any sort of uh, age verification in place, uh, especially in connection with, with uh, things you've said in the past about uh, CP and age of consent? You mean my d people posting nudes in the nude section of the Discord server that you have to be verified by the mods to get into? Uh, well, thank you, Chad, for giving me false information, and uh, I guess thanks for answering the question. This is what you're uh, coming at me with. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. Moving back to the audience. <laughs> hey. We're going to go ahead and move on to Lemon. Okay. Hey, Vosh. Uh, I had a question for you. So uh, recently there has been, uh, you know, up through gay marriage, we saw an increasing acceptance of LGBTQ rights among conservatives, liberals, and independents uh, in the mid-2010s. Uh, however, recently we've seen a uh, reversal, it's mostly among conservatives, it seems. Um, is this because of uh, purely because the liberal messaging around LGBTQ rights has not worked? Uh, or is there any broad style trends? Or, um, has there been a failure on the left? Or is this just conservatives have brought, have seem to have more broadly turned off to the LGBTQ community. Uh, to, to clarify, you're asking uh, if there's been a, a, a downward trend in queer acceptance? Uh, among conservatives. So overall, uh, okay. we saw um, 
from 2010 to around 20, I think it was 2016, 2017, we saw an overall increase <laughs> in all demographics, conservatives, liberals, and independents became more accepting of LGBTQ people in poll after poll. And we eventually, to the point where, uh, you know, gay marriage was relatively accepted by all, uh, you know, by all people of all, of all political persuasions, at least among conservatives, liberals, and independents. However, in the last year or two, uh, we've seen uh, LGBTQ acceptance go down, but mostly among conservatives, not among other groups. Yeah, well, so I'm the, just wondering. The right has shifted yeah. into using queer issues as a focal point for the culture war. Um, I mean, we, we had back in the lead up to 2015 with um, Obergsfell, of course, um, it was more significant from the right. But then after gay marriage became the law of the land, uh, there was a shift away from that for a time where there was kind of like a grasping at political positions. The main one for conservatives was abortion, of course, which has been the case for decades. But after gay marriage became, uh, you know, legal nationwide, that was like the main thing they could focus on. But now, obviously, over the past few years, they have shifted heavily into making queer issues the primary focal point. Notice how after they literally revoked Roe v. Wade, something that they'd been talking about doing for decades and decades, it barely even made a difference. Like, it genuinely didn't affect much about their messaging. There was no big, like, round of applause. There was no, oh my god, we finally did it. Um, because at this point, it's almost been made irrelevant. If anything, I would say it's been made a weakness because so many people are actually in favor of pro-choice policies when they're the ones who are pregnant or when it's someone they know. So they're, they're doubling down on the queer issues, but it's temporary. Their loss is guaranteed. They're fighting against human nature. Uh, they will lose, and then in a generation or two, they will all be gay. Okay, uh, thanks. Of course. Let's Next, we, we have uh, Ortimer. Uh, Ortimer, you are already on stage. Go ahead with your question. Uh, okay, so I've argued with a lot of people on your subreddit about this, and I wanted your take. So I think that the Just Stop Oil protests, specifically the like blocking traffic, are net negative for climate activism because of their overwhelmingly negative public reaction. Now, their supporters say that it's justified giving the impending climate apocalypse and that nearly anything would be justified. So if anything is justified in the name of climate activism, would I be morally justified in putting on blackface and shouting racial slurs at random people in the street and would that be effective? Well, you don't need to sell me on that one. If you're willing to go out there. No, um, I think what we're talking about fundamentally is what the goal of advocacy is. Usually the goal of advocacy is to win people over to your side, but that's not always the case. The Black Panther Party, for example, uh, was not exactly winning over the hearts and minds of whites across the nation. Their main goal was to scare people following police cars with guns drawn, showing up outside of courthouses, guns held upwards. Their goal was, uh, well, they knew they were going to make people angry, but um, they didn't care. I think the problem right now is that we are so f***ed when it comes to climate change, and nothing is happening, and nobody's taking it seriously, that I think you could make a fair argument, and I think Just Stop Oil is, is that the goal should not be to win people over, because... It, it doesn't even seem possible. Like, Al Gore was doing this 25 years ago. You know, like, the science has been out there for, for decades. What, what logical argument is going to win people over? At this point, the goal is just to make it a headline as much as possible. No matter how irritating or unlikable you are, if you are putting the subject of climate change in the newspaper headline, you are doing the thing they want you to do. Now, I don't necessarily think that's always the best option because, of course, not all attention is good attention, but they, I guess they've taken kind of like an accelerationist attitude towards the, the advocacy side of things. And honestly, given the fact that nothing else has worked, I, I think it might be the right move. Like, they are acting in a hateable fashion, but they're also getting the headlines. Maybe that's the most that can be done in an environment where people are so uncaring. All right, thank you. I'm I'm already putting on my shoe polish. So <laughs> good luck. Have a good time. Ready. Next, we're going to go ahead and move on to SV Point. SV Point, you are already on stage, so feel free to uh, say your question. Oh, okay. okay. I just want to. See. Sure. Christ, I've never actually done this before. Um, I'm from your chat. I started 
watching your streaming like a uh, I think like during COVID. I was originally like a Noah Samson fan, but like more to your side now because like of all the Professor Flowers whole thing. Um I was wondering, um, what is keeping you from playing the game No More Heroes? I just played um I I, I just played uh um Hi Fi Rush. I feel like I'm double dipping. Isn't Hi-Fi Rush just the better new version of No More Heroes? I should, though. I should. The first game's been on my list that for is, a long time. It has... It is... A, I kind of... When you played Hi-Fi Rush, I kind of like I saw like the similarities. But like in No More Heroes, there's like a... Very nice soundtrack. Like, especially in the second ones and the games after that. But... Along with that, I can see you laughing. I I understand how I sound. I'm very sorry. I think it's delightful, and I appreciate it. I do want to play the first one, maybe on stream. Okay. I, uh, thank you. I don't we'll think go I ahead and more. move on to uh, the big cigarette. Go ahead. The question is up to debate. you. Hello, hello, Vosh. <laughs> Howdy. I apologize. I I was had I was coughing. I didn't mean to interrupt anyone on stream when you're debating. I apologize for that not at all and in addition to my question i had a video game recommendation for you to play on stream whatever order you prefer what do you think about crab champions crab champions i think either that or crab champion it's the video game made by the crab rave guy first person crab shooter i did donkey play this i'm afraid i have no opinion on this specific subject but maybe i'll develop one as i google it ah yes i think i have seen donkey play this or at least somebody uh Somebody donkey adjacent. 10 out of 10 on Steam. My goodness. PC only, but my... Yeah, I'll take my... it to heart. Hmm. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. Go ahead, Juan. Uh, ask your question. Can you hear me well? Yes. Howdy. Oh, hey. All right, hey, Vosh. Howdy. Uh, my name is Juan. Uh, sorry if I'm a little nervous. Since I'm not particularly uh, accommodated to uh, doing public speaking, but... I've been watching you for a long time. Uh, a little glazing before I ask you my question. I've been watching you since about uh, the Sekiro stream. That was a long, long time ago. Yes, well, uh, let me get to the point. So I have a question. Hold on, I have it written down here. So I, 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 I hope that I, I was originally going. It was a bit of a two-parter, but you know they changed the rule on that. So I just hope that uh, you understand the cons, the like what's being referred to, so that way there's not like a what does that mean sort of situation. But uh, my question for you is so. Uh, out of all my disagreements with you, I think this question kind of summarizes or gets to like the point of like your core ideology. So, how does the how does your like vote blue no matter who sort of philosophy and like tactic compare to like the Stalinist uh, policy of like the Popular Front in terms of like the approaches and political to political alliances and ideological flexibility? You know, there's a lot of similarities in between like these two things that I don't think you're very like aware of. So I, I just wanted to ask you like, do you not see like what is your I, I guess what, I, what I'm getting at is like, do you think like you kind of have more similarities with like those trans than you actually like see yourself as having? I don't believe so. Uh, when I say vote blue no matter who, I don't say so to destroy ideological nonconformity. I do it because as the system exists currently, you can only really get a Republican or a Democrat president. That's the only choice we have. And as long as that's the choice we have, there is a correct answer. Um, Oh, okay, hold on. my my apologies. I didn't mean to cut you off. I know you were in the middle of question, but I, I guess like the Popular Front doesn't really refer to like voting blue no matter who, but like Popular Front is like putting aside like class struggle in terms of like supporting like the Liberal Party, which is pretty much what you support, right? Or would you say that's like a good description of like what you support? Well, I don't believe it's putting aside class struggle. I don't think that the class struggle is in any way negated by a Democrat victory. If anything, I think it's enhanced. It's a lot easier to be a socialist in a liberal democracy than it is to be a socialist in a fascist dictatorship. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think it's a matter of like ideological compromise. I think it's just a small, unfortunate, but necessary choice that we have to make. And we do a small part to a broader conclusion, sure. But, you know, again, I do think it's much easier for us under the Democrats. Okay. Uh... I mean, I still disagree, oh. and I wish we could discuss it more, but I, I'm, my time is up, so thank you. And a quick horse joke, uh, quit horsing around. My friends wanted me to make a horse joke. All right, bye. You did a great <laughs> job, right. too. Uh -huh. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to Carl Max. Go ahead, Carl Max. 
Hello, hi Vosh. Howdy. I've uh, been in your community for a while. We've interacted a couple times. I like your streams a lot. Thank you. I think yes, you're a I very remember. good advocate. Yay, that's nice. Um, okay, so my question for you, because I just started streaming myself, is, um, I, I know you've been asked this question a lot, but I wanted to know, what do you think the best way is to, like, grow for streaming, and has your, like, uh, advice on that changed over the years, given how, like, the landscape of streaming has changed? Not too much. It's mostly about boring stuff like search engine optimization, uh, making sure that you keep contacts with people and insert yourself in the right places at the right time, make sure the messages that you're giving are um, novel enough that people would specifically defer to you for your answers. You want to provide more than just a set of positions. You want to be a personality. Streaming is all personality mm -hmm. driven. Unlike any other media, you you have to be a personality for people to follow you, certainly to watch your live streams, you know, to tune in at a reliable time. And I think, you know, some people will be for that and some people won't. And it's definitely not a, you know, a, a, a meritocracy. It's a lot. A lot of it's luck based, but uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fun. It's worth at least dipping your toes into if you can. Okay. I think I can do that. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Have a nice, uh, have a nice AMA. Okay. Uh, Aaron, go ahead. Uh, oh, with your question. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, Vosh, big fan, kind of new. I mean, you have quite a catalog. I haven't seen all of it, but uh, someone else mentioned it'd be cool if you did uh, D and D streams again. Anyway, huge respect for just your general refusal to uh, back down to online bullies and criticism to some of you know what people consider hot takes. Um, someone else, you know, mentioned some hot takes that you've had before, but specifically to you openly stating that you've masturbated to child. Would you say that you're like a proud pedophile, or you're like you want to get better, or like where do you where are you on the map? If you're going to make stuff up about me, then why not make it more ostentatious? Like say I that mean, I took like a literally sex a video. To... You 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 said that you masturbated to Lolly and then felt guilty at the end. I don't recall that, but you can make up more. I'll I mean, send you, you the video. I, would you like me to send the, the video send of you saying that? No, the video of you saying it. Of how course, many, I'm not going to send you uh, child pornography. Archive videos do you have of child pornography? Are you not listening to what I'm saying? I'm saying videos of you speaking. Speaking? Well, yes. like on my channel. I've got a lot of those. Yes. Wait, I don't need more of yes. those. Yes. Well, you're denying a video that exists. Am I? Um, there's a huge catalog of you defending child, saying it's morally uh, okay <laughs> and all that stuff. How much? And do you then <laughs> he's like br browsing through his folder. Um, there, uh, there isn't. You know, obviously, this has all been discussed and litigated to a point well, a billion times over. But there usually, is. I'll when post, people I'll, are, I'll post uh, you free to. Usually, when people are terrified of, of my positions, they fall back into excuses not to listen. Though. If you are weird enough to actually try to talk with me about it. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, move on over to He's Culture bra Shock. Bracing through my giant folder of CP. <laughs> the one <laughs> labeled Vosh look at that. <laughs> so here's uh, Culture Shock here. It says, uh, is oh, the Democratic... Shit. Wait, I'm sorry. Wait. I think I, I think I just realized what he was referring to. He was lying, but I think he was referring to something inaccurately. Uh, there was an old, old, old video, like really early in my streaming, where I said that um, anime porn is infested with lollycon and that um and that like just looking through those sites like you're inundated with it constantly or something like that that's totally true by the way that shit needs to be like locked down massively it's insane people talk about n hentai like it's just a normal site and then it's like oh wait well if you if you don't specifically filter it out like two-thirds of results are lolly shit you know so that's pretty bad. So here we got the next question is, uh, is the Democratic Party becoming pro-black in a similar way to how the Republican Party is pro-white? Why are white supremacists often Republican and black supremacists often Democrat? Before your answer, I would like to give more context. Oh. The first thing I could point out is how both political parties use race as a recruitment tool. The Democratic Party is affiliated with BLM and discriminates against Asians and white students via affirmative action in higher university for the benefit of black students. The Republican Party uses great replacement theory and et cetera. This is from Culture Shock. This is not me quite uh, speaking. <laughs> just, clar <laughs> just clarifying. Um, Go ahead. Black supremacists are not Democrats. Trust me, I've argued with them. Black supremacists are almost always like uh, black separatists or like pan-Arabists or something. They're, 
there isn't really like a political space for black supremacy in America. And for the few black supremacists I've met who are American and talk about American issues, they're Republicans. Black supremacists and white supremacists historically get along with each other because they have a shared goal of removing black people from America. Black supremacists are usually separatists in the sense that they want to move over to Africa. And white supremacists will be like, oh yeah, great idea. Like, I'm pretty sure the current head of the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, is literally like an honorary KKK member. So, no. There's not really an equivocacy here. The real question is, like, are parties using unjustified racial anxieties as a focal point for recruitment? Um, and both parties do use racial anxieties, to be sure. Republicans refer to white people's fear of great replacement and uh, being racially conquered. Democrats refer to the black racial anxiety of being mistreated by the police. The problem is that black people are mistreated by the police and white people aren't actually at threat of genocide. So in the face of that stark contrast, I would say that, you know, it's really a matter of whether or not the racial messaging is legitimate, justified, or dangerous. And there's nothing really dangerous about supporting BLM. I mean, if anything, it's anti-danger. Uh, you'd be supporting reforms to the police that make Americans safer. Okay. And as for our next question, we have uh, Jamie Wacker. Jamie Wacker, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Uh, hi, for uh, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> uh, sorry. Lately, uh, for context, I live in Mexico, which is uh, the country below the USA. Uh, Thank you. I'm an and... American. I need that. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I mentioned it. And lately, in the news, due to like the new books that we're having nowadays, I'm seeing some sort of like shift in like politics in the country that are like more akin to American politics. Like usually politics in in Mexico are like basically South Park libertarians like, yeah, well, whatever would make the kid happy, right? And then the US is pretty much, yeah, let's just let's just gay, kill all the gay people. So I guess my question here is uh, how can I, or I guess a group of people uh, can stop like this spread of like American type politics in like countries where, you know, our right wing politicians aren't basically fascists. Yeah, it's really uh, like, I, I'm sorry, American conservative politics are being exported across the globe. Like the term woke, that was an African American slang term for a person like familiar with racial dynamics. And then it got co-opted by the right. And now just a few years later, you have like German conservatives going about Das Volken and, and French, you know, Le Woke or what, like it's, it's like it's spread everywhere. And that's of course, because when we talk about which side of the aisle uh, is- Excuse me, excuse me. We have uh, something, one of like- El Woke. Like, El Woke. <laughs> no, something funny that is happening. And I want you to like know this as like a context. Like one of like our big like conservative Christians politicians that we have here in Mexico are, are so calling. Jimmy, I hate like, to interrupt you. Uh, nothing against you or anything, but I have to move on to the next. Oh, person well, let me let me answer fully. Let me answer fully. Um, I I, I just uh, I just want to say we are exporting the discourse significantly, and it genuinely is disgusting. And this is because, despite what they say, if we're to refer to a pol particular side of the political aisle as like a shadowy group of international elitists who use money to spread political ideology across borders shiftlessly with no allegiance. To to nationality it's the right because the right moves alongside capital and capital under global capitalism is shiftless and international so that's True. why like immediately you have these right-wing talking points moving across like the plutocrats <laughs> and in in all these countries it is deeply unfortunate um i i i hope that because i imagine this would be an option in in mexico that the association with like american conservative politics could be kind of like a death knell for Mexican politicians, considering the fact that American conservatives are so racist against Mexicans. But I know it doesn't always work that way. I genuinely don't know what the solution is, but it's pretty fucked up. Thank you a lot. Sadly, this is like a big, big question with a lot of like layers and shit. Oh, I, I totally get it. And I want to do more research yeah. on Mexico. I've always wanted to visit Mexico. Maybe one day I will. Hit me up. Yeah, you'll just you'll just see <laughs> a, a, a fat gringo wandering the streets of Mexico City with like a, a, a smoothie to stay cool. We just finished off with uh, uh, Jamie. So now we will move on to Sleeping Cow. Go ahead, Sleeping Cow. Uh, hi, uh, I'm just wondering what you think about like nuclear disarmament versus keeping nukes as like a deterrent against like 
large scale war between, say, China and the U.S. I go, I lit, I go back and forth on this. The easy answer is like, well, nuclear disarmament would be best, and I think that at the very least, the uh, like the easy good answer is ninety nine percent nuclear disarmament with some like reserve held by superpowers with as a kind of contingency. The problem, obviously, is a who trusts America. I don't, and b like. I don't know if it would happen or not, but I can imagine a world where without nukes, like India, China, and and Pakistan, and Israel and all their neighbors, and Russia and their neighbors, and so on and so on, and the 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 consequence of this like global war would be a cutting of the supply lines that would end up effectively causing mu as much harm as like nuclear war would like 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 you know starvation billions dead just because everyone would be reduced down to like the local community level for agrarian needs and it would basically like end civilization without nukes because we're so reliant on international trade i i i don't know i i feel like we need fewer nukes than we have right now and if they're going to be nukes they should be in the hands of countries that rely heavily on international trade like the united states like china because those countries have a lot to lose if by just firing nukes off whereas countries like north korea and iran a lot less so but that's just my opinion all, all right. right thanks thank you very much uh, sleeping cow and uh, next we have lemon pepper police state go ahead lemon pepper police state with your question yeah, uh, big fan, been there since the side camera days, but I just have a quick question about uh, foreign policy. I apologize. No so, worries. So, like, at what point should, like, a global coalition to step in to prevent something bad from happening internally, like a genocide or something, uh, maybe, like, the Niger coup or something like that? And, like, what role should that global coalition take, whether it be militarily or financially? Yeah, it's it's really difficult to say because there are examples of good interventions. Like I think what we did in Syria was good, and there are bad ones. You know, Libya. Generally, interventions suck. They tend to be pretty bad. It's really, really mm -hmm. difficult to build up a country. And also, like, let's be fair, we can't do interventions to nuclear powers. So even if the world's biggest genocide is happening in the middle of Russia or something. Like it's not like NATO or the UN can yeah, go in and stop assuming that. Assuming non-nuclear countries. Yeah. Like, so, but, but I, that's, I know we're not going to do anything about like the the China, uh, the Uyghur genocide in China. That's like an like innate that. unfairness, though, right? Because I mean, small countries always live with like the looming threat true, of true. international intervention, whereas big countries don't have to. Even though we mathematically cause more harm, it would be good for us to recognize globally that interventions are sometimes necessary. There are times when we didn't intervene when we should have. And we should establish an international body that people trust to do that kind of work. Problem is, we've tried that, and people don't trust the UN. Haiti has reason to not trust the UN, you know? So it's one of those, like, idyllic scenarios, you know? Well, well what, if, what if we just made, like, an international coalition, everyone? Like, well, yeah, I don't know. God's, God willing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's kind of the answer I was expecting. It's, it's complicated. But, yeah, nice talking to you. Check it. You have a wonderful day. Have Goodbye. a wonderful day. Next, we have uh, Marokman. Go ahead, Marokman, and uh, give us your question. So, a bit of context first now. So, you, you haven't taken the Irish grill yet, so we're a very neutral country. We have a triple lock and all foreign policy deployments, all that stuff. So, what's happening right now is there's a big debate in the country uh, about maybe renegotiating our policy on neutrality. Because um, it's been something that's long standing since the founding of the state. And I was just wondering, do you think that neutrality is a moral foreign policy approach to take um, it, as a kind of blanket thing? You know, it, you know not, not neutrality in the sense of like looking at Ukraine, holding your arm, saying, ah, both sides are bad, but as a more genuinely just yeah we just, we just vibing over here man and just not getting involved in anything i think the neutrality can be valuable when you're acting as a mediator but mediators are rarely called for these days especially not impartial ones the reason you know right now at least that ireland wants to remain impartial is because you guys are a tax haven and you rely on the sheltering of international uh capital in order to you know generate your your your, your nation's sort of economic engine so it might oh, be we, your... we don't even generate anything off of that it's so over 
<laughs> okay, to you, it you, all just leaves the country. You, you simple. Well, I guess that's the problem with tax havens as a mode of national uh, growth. I mean, you know, like the the Swiss at least had their 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 Jewish gold. The Nazis gave them whatever the case may be. I th well, there it is, right? Tax havens are bad for the world generally for a number of reasons, and I think that the on a political level, I imagine the Irish want to maintain a kind of distance from this because of their oppositional pi politics to the UK, right? Like that's, that's like it happened back in world war two as well. You know, Nazis don't like the UK. So Ireland's kind of like, well, you know, ah, yeah, holding their hands up. I think that joining in would be a good, good idea at this point. Personally, I think, I mean, Ireland is unquestionably a part of Europe and everyone knows it and everyone acts it and getting the politics and the economy in line with that might be to the betterment, not only of the world, but to your country as well. Oh, th thanks, lad. Cover more Irish content now. I'll try to, and I should. You have such wonderful Thank accents. Thank you. I love you. I love you. Take care. Thank you, uh, Marokman. Next, we have uh, Jungle Karma. Go ahead and ask your question, Jungle. Hey, Vos, appreciate you and all the content you always put out, so I just want to say that first. But, um, you know, I, the U.S., I think, is in a mental health crisis, and I think a lot of people recognize that um, from things you see with uh, opioid epidemic and... Uh, how people are on social media and different things like that. Um, something I think is, you know, potential for healing that kind of pain that's across the country is psychedelics. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts or experiences or just anything about psychedelics that you would want to share. Thank you. I'm personally distrustful of psychedelics because um, I have a bipolar disorder which means that occasionally I have uh, cycles of mania and depression. I take lithium for this, and in so doing, I'm fine. But it's always made me very suspicious of altered mental states because it can be very frustrating to be sitting there feeling very good or very bad and knowing, like, wow, this this sure is temporary. Like, you know, because all your thought processes are, like, you know, leaning towards a conclusion, but at some level you have to tell yourself, well, this isn't really what I'm going to think when I'm in a normal state. And then, like, what is a normal state, right? There's no way of knowing, which can make it a bit more frustrating. Am I in a good mood, or is it mania? Am I in a bad mood, or is it depression? That's one of the reasons why I'm a bit distrustful. It's all just, uh, it, it messes with a process that I have a tenuous enough hold on as it is. However, I've read studies about microdosing psilocybin being good for depression. I'm too scared to try it, personally, at least at the moment. And I've been doing pretty all right, so I don't feel I need to. You know, it... Chemicals are chemicals. If there's validity to that research, and if people use it responsibly, I think it can be pretty good, potentially. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate you. Um, I, um, the next ahead. person we have is uh, down with Zeppi. Go ahead, down with Zeppi, with your question. Uh, hello, Mr. Vosh. My name is JT, and my pronouns are he, him. Um, my question to you is this. So I, I am a... Uh, I'm a sympathizer of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I'm not a Maoist. I am a Dengist, if you're familiar with uh, who those two people are. That being said, um, why does it appear to be that it, when it comes to, like communist leadership, like Stalin and Mao, like I've read some of their works. I don't know if you have or not, but it appears to me that Stalin and Mao only, fuck, only sought to use communism as a means of acquiring power. Um, I know you said earlier that, uh, you know, communism would, would solve all issues, um, but how would communism solve the issue of madmen like Mao and Stalin from attaining power? Like how, how, how would communism present, prevent those people from, people from attaining power? Sorry. Well, this is the boring answer, but I, th I think it's actually quite radical. I think that you have to be radically democratic before everything else. Because I agree with you, you know, so many so-called communist or socialist parties or revolutions have and essentially just been personality cults for a specific leader. They say, you know, do away with this democratic apparatus, do away with this one and that one. I will lead the party. We don't need distractions. We don't need infighting. I will manage it. And then, of course, they're just a dictator and it's just any other dictatorship. Mm -hmm. I think that d we, we think of democracy in its current form, liberal democracy, as this cut down, fake, agitated thing. But democracy as, as like an underlying principle is the single best thing liberalism stands for and fails to adhere to. We need to take that and radicalize it. 
Marx was a firm believer in democracy on every level. That's why he posited socialism not as equality, but as freedom, a, a, a mechanism both on an economic and pol political level where you can maximize the degree to which people have autonomy and self-control, positive freedom. Uh, if, if a movement is anti-democratic, I will almost always speak against it. Uh, even if it brings great material wealth to its people, even if it's very good for its people, it will, if not democratic, ultimately fall on itself. And this happens time and time and time and time again. So that's that's where my sympathies lie. You know, I as long as there is democracy present in a movement, even if it's slow or faltering or failing, I think that there's value there. But if there is no democracy present, if there's no meaningful way of addressing internal issues, like even if there's good being done now, the system is broken right? I mean, you can arrive at temporarily good outcomes through bad processes, you know? Like you could, you know, after, after, a, a, after a flood, you know, new nationwide policy, remove all water in sight. It's great for the first day and terrible for the second year. It's just something that I, I worry about a lot. That's one of the reasons why I push so hard for the vote blue no matter who thing. Not because Democrats are excellent stewards of democracy, but because Republicans would take it away. And we need that, even in its weakened form. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bosch. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I hope I sh be able to uh, debate you on uh, America's um, failed foreign policy of the past 50 years at some point in the future. Thank God you. willing. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, hey, Bosch, we had uh, another question called, uh, which said, I see the concept of trans genocide to be a valid to be a va uh, to be as valid as a concept as white genocide, which is to say, not at all. Mm -hmm. In both respects, it seems that the word genocide is being used cynically for its emotional effect, suggesting the eventual physical destruction of these groups. I know you are a proponent of transgenocide, uh, either being ongoing or upcoming. Can you tell us exactly what it entails? Yeah, the rhetoric of the Republican Party is explicitly eliminationist when it comes to trans people. There's a degree of abstraction that you have to do to work out the white genocide thing where it's like, oh, they mean demographic replacement. And then you look at the demographic replacement. It's like, oh, well, it's not really happening. But they say it's happening. It's like uh, uh, people are having interracial sex. Maybe in five million years, everyone will be at least coffee toned, you know, whatever. Um, whereas the rhetoric and the law being applied to trans people is flatly eliminationist. Um, with statements being made by people like Michael Knowles to the effect of we need to eliminate transgenderism to policies being pushed in red states, which do everything from ban the teaching of them as a group to uh, saying that the public expression of trans identity is tantamount to sex work or pedophilia. Um, really, that, that was a thing. And it was found to be a violation of the uh, Americans' constitutional rights. But that's what they're trying to do. You know, the idea that uh, any kind of drag performance, which by their definition would include somebody who's male wearing female clothing, which describes a lot of trans people, that them performing in public like a dance would be considered like stripping. You know, this now the Republicans aren't going to come out here and say that they're going to build death camps because not even the Nazis came out there and said they're going to build death camps. You have to look at what the pattern of law and rhetoric is building towards. And I think that respectfully. I think that you would have to be quite ignorant to not think this is eliminationist in nature. That's why it's so essentialized. The idea, and this is very common to Republican rhetoric, the idea is that trans people are a form of social degeneracy, which were a product of liberal elites who are trying to corrupt Americans by normalizing and abetting this mental illness, and that these degenerates can't be presented in public because that spreads the degeneracy. This is word for word identical to the rhetoric the Nazis took with gay people. Like, it's not, like, there's no, and, and with the wave of legislation against them, the fact that the entirety of the Republicans' political will is back behind it, there is just no comparison to the made-up narrative of white genocide. I will admit that genocide has stages, and with trans people, they are not at their final stage. But genocide does not begin when the first death camp opens its gates. If it did, then it wouldn't be a very useful word. I mean, you might as well just use like mass ethnic killing at that point. You're you're no longer referring to a social process or a historical trend. You're you're referring to like a an an, an act or a policy. Okay, thank you. All right, go ahead, Dink. All right, hello. Hello, Hi, Dink. Hi, boss. I'm a big fan of you. Hello. Are you German by chance? I uh, no. I just had a really sad voice from a from a bike accident earlier today. Oh. Just making sure. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing good. Um, so okay. that was good, by the way. I like that. 
I, I appreciate, I appreciate it. So, uh, if the transgender side is real, does that mean that the sexual systemic exploitation of black men also real, otherwise known as buck breaking by my lord and savior Tariq Nasheed? Can you describe buck breaking to me? Uh, I, you know, a systemic sexual exploitation of black men via by means of, you know, first through slavery, second through, uh, you know, reconstruction efforts and Jim Crow laws, and now, you know, you got, as, as my lord and savior would say, advanced uh, buck breaking mechanics through the prison system. If the argument is that black men are continually victimized uh, and have been no, 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 you're missing what I'm saying here, Bosh. Sexually, systemically oppressed. Okay, well, I would certainly agree that both the prison system and slavery involved enormous amounts of sexual exploitation. I'm sure the Jim Crow era did as well. I'm not as familiar with how that would exactly work. Well, well certainly, sure, yeah. Well, the fear of, of black men's sexuality has been a cornerstone of white supremacy for hundreds of years in this country. You know, they used to castrate black men before hanging them if they would uh, flee the plantation. The, the, the myth of them, like, you know, being the white women or whatever. I mean, this has been around for a long time, presumably due to the sexual insecurity of white men. Uh, well, yes, I, I, I suppose I do agree that buff breaking is a huge issue. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it, Vosh. I'm going to move on to Kova. Go ahead, Kova. Hello, Vosh. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing wonderfully. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. Basically, I'd like to uh, ask you a question that's been on my mind lately a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... Basically, I'm like like a white guy, so I guess it's like I don't know. There's there's kind of like this movement around me of uh, people who are like talking about like take back uh, what's yours and all this like racial stuff. So, but basically, I am uh, I'm in favor of uh, of I like I like the idea of uh, spaces for white people, but I want to. Uh, I only like to date Japanese girls, and I want to, like, have a family with a Japanese girl, and so does that make me a race traitor? By your definition, it unquestionably would. Though you can free yourself of that burden by just not being racist, and then but, you a Japanese girl would just be based in red pilled, which is what it would but, be if I did it. But but they but they were they were they were uh, allied with uh, with Hitler in World War Two. Yeah, and so were the Italians, and they're all black. I, I, I'm not opposed to that either. I just I just, I just really want to uh, have have like ten children with like a, a hot Japanese woman, and I don't want to be a race traitor. So I, I like I need your help. As yeah. long as you expand your definition of race traitor to encompass acceptable pairings with black Italians, uh, all people along the Mediterranean going all the way down to Turkey, and all East Asian people, since there's certainly a lot of uh, genetic uh, overlap between uh, Japanese people and Koreans, given what the Japanese were up to at the time. I think that we can encompass about 80% of the world's population in your white ethno state. And then you'll be able to have as many children as you want. Yeah, I, I, I think that if I had a, like eight children with like a Japanese woman, it would start like the uh, the super hyperborean race from Magartha of like white and Japanese uh, mixed children, and that would be like the greatest race ever in the history of the world. Isn't so, isn't this what I, doesn't I'm this lead to that that like incel Hapa community mm -hmm. or whatever where they're the half half Asian half white parents and then they're like complaining because they're shorter on average than I am or something isn't isn't that a thing? Oh yeah, but like basically those people they they don't know what's good because like Asians and and whites are like specifically like Japanese and German germanic mixing together it'll like create the new hyperborean race and it'll like take over the world gotcha. okay i think but, we're i think we're good with, i think we're pretty good with this guy I next we're away. gonna go on with uh uh oi daxi wang also it's pronounced da xi wang the great king of the west fascinating character from chinese history uh before i begin Bosch, uh despite this being uh, not the most ideal uh you know occasion this is Dinoman talking. <laughs> oh, hey, what's up? Yes, yes, I. It's very nice speaking with you uh, in this occasion. But uh, my question has nothing to do with our talk. If uh, you, you know, just also kind of a friendly reminder about that thing going on. But my question has nothing to do with politics. As I want to diverge a little bit from more heavy topic. As someone who have um, basically beg of you to review the uh, 
announcement trailer of Grand Casse of uh, Total War Warhammer 3. Uh, what is your opinion on their uh, new release, oh, about to release new DLC, The Shadow of Change, and raising the price to $25 for one DLC? I find it quite ridiculous, and I hope uh, Creative Assembly will do a better job of managing their uh, marketing or games in the future. I, I do have a good feeling about the DLC, but... I, I, I understand why there's outrage over it. I'm learning about this from you. Wait, hold on. What's the new race? Oh, uh, the new race is the Changeling from Zange. And they also have two legendary heroes. And also from uh, Grand Kasse, there will be the new legendary lord, uh, Grenbo, the uh, Jade Dragon. Wait. The other dragon sibling. So it... And also there's the uh, Akizla Baba Yaga. So wait, there's going to be two change races? One of them being... The... Oh, no. Uh, one legendary lord, uh, but two legendary heroes. And one legendary Wait, lord is, from Kasei. Is there not even an entire new race and they're charging $23? It's literally... Exactly. It's, it's way more expensive than the Chaos Dwarf DLC, Holy in my opinion. Holy shit, what are they doing? Wait, I'm actually I'm learning about this now. That's f***ed up. Wait, hold on. Three knowledge of the lords, changeling of change, established good stratagems with Yonbo's Grand Kasei. What the f***? Okay, are they in debt? How much coke have they been doing over there in, in the office? Um... I suspect something to do with Fer uh, um, the uh, Feral, the new historic Total War game, turns out kind of going to be a little failure. I hope, uh, you know, everything had turned out better than Total Warhammer, uh, Total War uh, Three Kingdom. They gave up that game after two DLC, which was very sad as a Chinese. It was devastating for the community. We were all very sad back then. Oh, Creative oh, Assembly. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Oi. Thank you very take, much, take Oi. Take care, Dashi friend. And, and um, looking forward to our talk in you're, the future. If you should, um, it's, move it's, on it's still there. To, it's marked priority. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to move on over to Fred Bear. Go ahead, Fred Bear. The floor is yours. Okay, so I've got... So I'm English. This is a very... <laughs> it's like 4 a.m., something like that. Um... So I've got a funny question and a, um, and a serious question. So what I'm going to say is the serious one. And that is, like, so, like, you know about electoralism. Um, and I'm a, I'm a fan, so this is a bit. <laughs> I think you're doing wonderfully. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so the Labour Party in England it has slowly shifted nothing but right. I, I hate Keir Starmer, and I hate his party. And your like your approach in America is like to well to always vote Dem, right? But I don't see the same thing. So I would. So I'm just wondering if I should vote Green or something where they actually have a shot at like, doing better than they do in America here, right? Because the system's slightly different. Yeah, I would, I would actually vote Lib Dem or Green over there. Cause the, the, so the problem is, is that the gap between the parties is much larger over here than it is over there. Um, like, our Republicans are worse than your guys by far. Um, but also your Labour Party is, is, is like sinking, right? Um, you you also have an uh, you you have a uh, uh, you know a parliamentary system, so there's slightly more room, more shoulder room for for expression outside of just a, a party duopoly. But also, I think a critical difference is that the Labour Party has done something astonishing. Right, the Democrat Party over here in America is inconsistent, dishonest, uh, almost maliciously incompetent, um, and completely capital focused. But it is generally, I think, consistent. You know we kind of know what we're getting. The Labour Party revealing that it promoted claims of anti-Semitism in order to fuck over Corbyn and then shifting right, like lurching <laughs> to the right once Corbyn's oh, out no. to, to become, no, to, to, to become, to, to essentially return to like a Blairite position. But worse, yeah, I think no. Blair wouldn't have, sh I genuinely think that Blair would not have done this like massive rightward lurch. I think that Blair would do a Biden thing now where he'd be like trans people, three genders, you know? I think there's three genders yeah. or maybe more. It's worse than that. So I the, the Labour Party has fallen. Okay. It's Rome, it's burning, yeah. it doesn't exist anymore. Godspeed, your country is falling apart. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, okay. That's yeah, that's fair. Uh, also there's, there's, there's something funny I kinda wanna say is that ever since I began watching you, there is a precise uptick in the amount of bitches I have got. 
and I can't like I can't explain why. It's just the more Valsh I've watched, the more the, the more I it, don't know. It just keeps coming. It's all confidence. The uh, the incels were wrong, and I'm happy to hear that. It, <laughs> anyway, thank yeah. you uh fred bear uh, we are moving on to and i cannot read hebrew i i think that's hebrew yes it is it, it, it's, just, it's just as homo that's all it says <laughs> all right so my question is this and it's kind of a segue from your from a previous question that was asked before about environmentalism and stop oil um, my question is, do you think increased environmental vigilantism as a result of struggles caused by climate change due to a lack of resources, such as a lack of access to water in South Asia, will become more prevalent and more extreme in nature? And do you think that those extremer forms of environmental vigilantism would be moral and ethical? Well, the first thing I want to say to um, any State Department agents watching is that, morally speaking, first and foremost, my priority is to never violate the laws <laughs> of the United States. I would never even think about it. I think that um, environmental vigilantism is a tragic, unavoidable consequence of the current state of affairs. I, I think it's like, not only is it real, but it's going to be something that we're going to have to actively prepare for. People keep earthquake kits when one hits, what, every 20 years in their town? Um, we're going to need kits for when the local, uh, you know, power station gets blown. When pipelines are blown up, it's going to get pretty bad. And as things get increasingly bad, more and more resources from the state will be dedicated to protecting their lines of control. More money spent on police and possibly, say, National Guard in the United States protecting vital energy infrastructure. Over in China, they have already begun a broader military strategy of defending their import. They get their oil, most of their oil, from the rest of the world. It all comes in through the South China Sea, so they do everything they can to expand the definition of the South China Sea, and that area is about as well-guarded navally as you could possibly get it. This is going to be an increasing problem. Uh, China and Russia are going to bicker over water resources. Uh, when Los Angeles falls, and it will fall, by the way, it would not take much to disrupt water availability over there, uh, climate refugees are going to be both an internal and external threat. The only things I can really suggest is to prepare for these because they're going to happen. It's not, I don't even think this is like a particularly like socialist perspective. I think that a reasonable assessment of the current state of affairs pulls us in that direction. And it's, it's going to get very rough uh, very quickly. I think we're going to see basically overnight the, the mainstream position on climate issues shift from we need to do what we can to shift to renewable energy to we need to do what we can to protect non-renewable like plants from getting bombed because that'll be like right. otherwise it'll mean like mass blackouts and people always value their own inconveniences over the world's you know so it's it's gonna get rough yeah do you think it'll be productive i i think that it, there are going to be some well first of all no action against the state is productive ever uh all things that are crimes are morally wrong but I certainly think that some actions taken in that in that venue would be um, very effective at drawing people's attentions towards some necessary conclusions. Though, very much like the stop oil business, it's going to be pretty difficult to thread the line of getting headlines and getting support. Right, right. Now, there was a Judeo-Bolshevist conspiracy theorist who debated a while ago, and I actually ended up debating him too, and he said he would give me $500 in crypto if I beat him in the argument. And... Uh, he just left the server when I beat him. So I was, wondering if you could, I was wondering if you could tell him that he owes me $500 in crypto. Yeah, he does in crypto. Yeah. 500 um, bitcoins even. Yeah. Next, I would say that. yeah. <laughs> Next we have uh, Doge Lama. Uh, go ahead, Doge Lama, with your question. Um, Vosh, did you want me to go ahead and uh, make this the final question? We're uh, 30 minutes past. I'm not would sure say how long you're willing. One more over this one. And that'll be it for me. Very well. Okay. Sounds good. Let, Go ahead, Doge Lama. Let me Lama. introduce Doge Lama. Okay, right. It's he's gonna be he's gonna have a great question for you. Okay, right. Hey, uh, Bosch. Thank you so much for being here. I uh, like I really do appreciate you listening to all of us um, ask you a right, well, wide range of questions. You appreciate me. You put me in contact with Donald Trump. That's crazy. No, I, I mean God. Uh, I'm just really grateful right. he introduced me. Um, so I'm just curious how you perceive like our debates and our discussions in general um to be like 
how do you see those being productive in the state that our world is in right now? Like if we are going to crumble as a society because capitalism doesn't necessarily, um, I mean, obviously it doesn't necessarily uh, take care of the people that live within the society. How is it that we're going to maintain ourselves with this shit and like do all these discussions then become null and void once the recession impending hits or like you know i don't know if that makes sense sorry I'm a little first bit of all at least judging from the emails that i get i think that i help a lot of people on an individual level you know oh, absolutely it's, it's not it's not all about how to change the world people are the world you know, being able to make people more comfortable in their skin, give them the right arguments to deal with a family member or friend, or to reconcile uh, an internal disagreement they've had, that's valuable in and of itself. But more, moreover than that, I don't want to overstate my own importance here, you know. Obviously, I have a lot of influence, but it's nothing compared to some people. I think that uh, there's a remarkable sort of cascade effect if you handle things properly. For example, thousands of people from my community have done canvassing and phone banking with Progressive Victory, the associated org that helps the fascists not win in this country. And a lot of those people are young, and a lot of them are going to grow up and be DC staffers. It's very possible, not guaranteed, but still possible, that someone who grew up watching me will one day have a hand in uh, drafting legislation or voting on it. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it might yeah. turn out to be that way, but as long as I act as though it's a possibility, I feel there's a decent chance that I can make it happen on some level. And those changes, of course, cascade into further ones. So I think how how much of an effect will we have? I don't know. Maybe I die tomorrow. Maybe a car hits me. The most no, you I hope can, not. <laughs> well, me too. The most that we can hope for is to do our best and to be satisfied with that. Maybe our best is enough and maybe it isn't, but it is our best. And that's the most we can hope for. That's a fantastic answer. Thank you guys so much for like letting me ask that question. And Bach, I do appreciate the, the positivity there. So I think all of us are in it together. And if shit does crumble, uh, we're all going to crumble together. So thanks for our friend. next and final person who will be asking a question. We Two have more. McLovin here. Two more, actually. After Two this, more? Okay. After uh, this, I would like Ghosty to come on. Ghosty, you've got it. I will go ahead and make that happen. Anything you want, Bosh. Okay. Hey, Bosh. Howdy. As a libertarian socialist myself, I'm kind of curious as to who the most significant political influences are in your life, what are their works, and why? Well, I guess, like, you know, there's, there's, there's Marx and Bernie Sanders. I, I think the biggest one probably would have to be uh, Rosa Luxemburg, I think. Because one of the, I feel like a lot of lefties are pretty good about learning about the history of leftism and leftist ideology and why it's important, but they're not really great at learning about its failures. And mm. I, I think that Rosa was, was like the, was like the crux. She was at like the, the exact intersection point of what may be scaled out into like the biggest failure on the left, which is sort of like an inability to effectively differentiate revolutionary sentiment and social democratic progressivism in a juxtaposition against fascism. And and this is a problem that keeps happening, I guess. So I think I learned a lot from that. But when I when I was just getting started with um my lefty beliefs, it was Fred Hampton. The assassination of Fred Hampton isn't of course anything that Fred Hampton has written. It was written after he was assassinated, but his his life and his story have been very influential. Thank you. Of course. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, Ghosty. Ghosty, go ahead with your question. Hi, thanks. I just wanted to ask a little question about degrowth. It was like just something that's been bothering me lately. Um, just. Uh, what the f uh, Hey, Vosh, you're hot. What was the cool. point of that? Okay. Bosh, Wait, what was the argument? Uh, Wait, can you, can you bring her on? Wait, I didn't hear. Can you ask her to repeat that? No, what, no. Bosh? No. <laughs> you're bad, Vosh. Please. We have an actual parcel of the question here. We could answer instead, baby. What God. a troll, Bosh. I was. I actually. I actually didn't hear what it was. I was reading chat. Oh, they um, said. Oh, they uh, scream the n word. They scream they the n word, and, and I didn't even get to hear it. Okay, whatever. Yeah. All right, somebody who isn't them. We we said one more, right? That didn't count. How about, how about yeah. Okay. Well, I have Mike, the spelling oh, expert. If you, you want go. to forego my list here, we can go to uh, oh, baby oh, hot dog. Yeah. All right, go ahead, baby hot dog. Hi, can you guys hear me? Howdy. Yep. Yes, hi. 
Uh, so, Bosh, you're part of this uh, ecosystem on YouTube that's like this, you know, streamer, debate bro, like you, Destiny, I Hypocrite. Um, what I want to ask you is, uh, do you feel as your channel starts to become, starts to get bigger and bigger, uh, I don't know who changed my name to Biden lover, but how dare you? But um, as your channel gets bigger, do you ever feel, because what I've noticed is like streamers that I've followed for a while, even if they start out a bit nuanced and middle ground, they tend to become more extreme as time goes by. Like Jimmy Dore, for example, started as like somebody that like was like, oh, a comedian and has like left wing takes to now completely bananas. So what I want to ask you is, and I don't even know if you could answer this, uh, but do you feel as your channel gets bigger and you have more subscribers, do you ever feel pressured that like there's some things that come up that you want to have a more nuanced take about, but the idea or the maybe the pressure of like losing uh, subscribers or saying something that will piss off your fan base, does that become more uh, and more of a reality in the content that you put out? No, I feel like if anything, I've gravitated in the other direction. Uh, I do think that that's a pattern. I think that's a real thing that uh, that that definitely tends to happen, in large part because it can be difficult to maintain the interest of an audience mm -hmm. without like doing that shift. I, I I think though, the more time I spend here, the more I define myself in opposition to the people who fall into that process. Jimmy Dore is one example, right? But like a lot of lefties seem to think that good geopolitical analysis is the same as being anti-American. Now, don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. That is a substitution that will get you a correct answer a decent number of times, but it's not the same as having a good geopolitical take. And now we see this, of course, with Ukraine, where for some reason, like the pretty much all of the, you know, Western liberal world and quite a bit of the non-Western liberal world united in their support of Ukraine and a bunch of lefties start hand rigging and start like making defenses for Russia and like, eh, maybe the NATO did that. Like, you know, it's really weird. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I want to gravitate more towards nuance. I think that it, it takes a lot of principle to know when you can be like a brash advocate and when you have to kind of dial it down. And the key to not feeling the pressure in that, in, in that sense, I think, is to know how to be interesting and funny and engaging, even when you're not pushing some kind of like cultist, you have to listen to me narrative, you know? Um, right. Because, because otherwise, like you, you feel people will will sort of skip out on you. It's a kind of insecurity. It's I don't I don't find Jimmy Dore particularly interesting or funny. Um, maybe he feels he has to do that trend towards extremism in order to keep people's interest. Right. Well, cool. Uh, thanks for answering my question. Of course, and All thank right. you for asking. And uh, Vosh, I just want to thank you very much for joining debate politics um, and entertaining this AMA. And for those who are listening. You can find us for other exciting debates and hang out with us on discord.gg forward slash debate politics. Good to have you here, Vosh, and I'm going to ask you a classic closing question to quote the legendarily hilarious Jesse Lee Peterson. Did you have fun? I did have fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope you All have right. a wonderful day. You Thank have you a everybody. great night. Great Take time. care. Thank you. Have a great evening. Peace, everybody. Well, I'd say that was pretty fun, actually. I'd I'd say that was a that was a nice um, that was a nice uh, scatter shot of uh, of of questions, especially that second to last one. Real high IQ stuff there. What was that a server for? Politics debate.